Please stand for the national anthem. everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Let us bow our heads in prayer, please. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you for bringing us here safely. Dear Lord, bring those who are coming on their way. And we just want to pray that you bless our proceedings this evening. Be with uh, all our participants, all the persons who have a part to play in today's proceedings, dear Lord. And we just want to thank you for all these things and carry us back safely to our destinations. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mrs. Mirage. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. How are we feeling? Hmm. Um, welcome to the... Uh, Conversations for Change, Reimagining Civic Power and Responsibility series. Today, it is hosted by Disclosure Today, a non-profit organization, non-political organization from the standpoint of partisan politics. But as I would say, as we discuss, as we go along, um, we all have to become political, but it doesn't have to be in a partisan context. Um, this event is hosted today by Disclosure Today and the Civicus Alliance, which is an international NGO uh, dedicated to strengthening civic citizen action and civil society throughout the world. Both Disclosure Today and Civicus are nonpartisan, and we seek to amplify the voices and opinions of ordinary people. We recognize that for effective and sustainable civic participation to occur, citizens must enjoy rights of free association and be able to engage all sectors of society. I am Margaret Rose, by the way, sorry about that, um, one of the directors of Disclosure Today. We are launching this CFC series on the Global Day of Citizen Action 2015. This is the second year that this uh, day is being recognized, and it is made up of a series of events all over the world happening at this, on this day, all collated on one website and web platform. And so we are being recorded, and what you see is going to be part of that whole discourse, and it's about encouraging you the people to become more active on civic issues. Today we chose uh, the topic for our first conversation for change, citizen empowerment through freedom of information. Because we see freedom of information, access to information as critical and having a critical um, linkage uh, with citizen engagement and uh, political accountability. And on this day, we have also chosen to single out two men 
for recognition, for recognition, for their work on this particular important civic issue of freedom of information. So some of you may ask, well, why did we choose Senior Counsel Ramesh Launch Miraj and Afro Raymond to be uh, our inaugural uh, conversants in this conversation? It is because the topic is citizen empowerment through freedom of information, and these two men have been game changers in that regard in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Ramesh Launch Miraj, I'm not going to read out his entire bio, but we have put his bios in your packages um, for you to see. Um, senior counsel, former attorney general. He was the attorney general that actually championed the freedom of information legislation and promoted it, and uh, um, we got it. Uh, I, I would just like to say personally that, um, you know, as an attorney at law for the past 20 years in Trinidad and Tobago, we cannot help, and those lawyers who are in the audience today, you cannot help but recognize the contribution made by Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Miraj SC because. Um, he was the Attorney General responsible not only for the Freedom of Information legislation, but for the Judicial Review Act and amendments to the Integrity in Public Life Act and um, Prevention of Corruption Act, a spate of legislation that we had in the early 2000 era, 1999-2000-2001, which uh, we attribute to Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Miraj, Senior Counsel, and which really increased the space of the citizen versus the state enlarge the power of citizens in their interaction with the state. And so that is why we wanted to single out Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Mraj, Senior Counsel, on this particular day, Global Day of Civic Citizen Action. Secondly, Mr. Afro Raymond, his bio is also um, before you, so I'm not going to go into lengthy detail on, detail on it, but for those of you from Trinidad and Tobago here, and I think most of us are from Trinidad and Tobago, he needs very little introduction. He has been um, a citizen activist um, over the last several years. He has been working steadfastly in the area of public procurement reform and also now taking up issues in relation to CLECO and, and, and trying to deal with accountability on that issue and also now leading the charge on issues relating to land and political campaign finance reform. Um, we, we asked Mr. Afra Raymond to be a part of the conversation this evening because he, as a citizen, has actually used the freedom of information legislation successfully um, more than once. And so we think that he has, you know, some, you know, a, a great contribution uh, to make to us as citizens uh, understanding the challenges that he faced and that sort of thing. And so we single these two men out as beacons to other citizens on what is possible even in the face of political systems and structures which are resistant to change and with the hope that all citizens will be inspired or as many citizens as we can have inspired will be inspired to also take action. As a token of this recognition and as a token Disclosure today, along with our international partners, in particular Civicus, would like to honor these men as the inaugural recipients of the Award for Civic Entrepreneurship 2015, or as we uh, and the DT team now like to call it, and we hope it will catch on, the ACE 2015 Award. We, we, it's for Civic Entrepreneurship, which broken down simply means Civic deals with the relationship between the citizen and the state and looking at the rights, duties, responsibilities, and privileges, and entrepreneurship, as you know, connotes uh, creativity, innovation, and persistence in creating real value. And uh, I'm sure that you would all agree, and I hope that you agree, <laughs> um, that both these men have demonstrated an uncommon resilience in pursuing and creating initiatives around enlarging civic space in Trinidad and Tobago, and so I would like to invite uh, Ms. Tanya Alexis of, Disclosure, of the Disclosure Today team to... Hmm? You don't do Afro, please? Yeah. Ms. Tanya Alexis to come and present the ACE to Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Miraj, Senior Counsel. <clears throat> Sorry, Justin Phelps then. Okay, Justin, he, this is not Miss Alexis. Uh, could you all, no, could, but, but could you all have met him? We're very informal here. Thank you. 
That is Mr. Justin Phelps, the chief legal strategist in Disclosure Today. Um, and I'd like to invite Ms. Tanya Alexis now, our chief puzzle solver, to present uh, the ACE to Mr. Afra Raymond. Thank you, Afra, for all your contributions. And if Ramesh and Afra can come up to the... Tanya, they are here? Please let them know. During the course of the year coming, we will be sharing more with you on this ACE honor, which we hope in the future to receive nominations for on an annual basis. Um, we hope, one, to engage the business, civil society, and citizens, all of you, in the nomination and selection process and to keep the standard very high for the citizens who are singled out for these honors. The purpose of this award is to develop a people's recognition for civic citizen action as distinct from national awards which are of necessity a more top-down laudation. We aim to make this an award by the people in recognition of the work for the people as distinct from an honor which is bestowed in large part by the political directorate of the day. That said, let us get on with the business of today. Um, we are moving very quickly because we want to keep as quickly to time. We started a few minutes late. And that is our first conversation for change on citizen empowerment through freedom of information. We are very pleased to introduce to you our moderator for this evening, Mr. Rishi Maraj. And his bio is also before you, but I will take the time to read his bio. Mr. Rishi Maraj is, in fact, part of the Disclosure Today team, and uh, he is our information and privacy technologist. Mr. Maraj is the holder of a BSc and MSc in government from the University of the West Indies. His research paper for his MSc focused on curbing corruption, a comparative examination of anti-corruption agencies in Trinidad and Tobago, Hong Kong, and Australia. Mr. Maraj has over 10 years of experience working in the public sector of Trinidad and Tobago and has been involved in the administration of the Freedom of Information Act for over seven years. During the period 2009 to 2012, he was the senior officer in charge of the said unit and training the public officers and senior public servants in the operations of the act, as well as advising members of the public on how to fully utilize the act. He also provided technical advice on the passage of the Data Protection Act in 2011 and participated in the drafting of model legislation on freedom of information and data protection throughout, through the International Telecommunications Union, HIPCAR, project. Mr. Mirage is also a certified member of the Canadian Institute of Access and Privacy Professionals. So very pleased to uh, uh, ask Mr. Rishi Mirage to join us um, on the stage um, as our moderator and as you can see we chose him because he was a key player in building the capacity of public sector professionals on the use of the freedom of information legislation as I said at the beginning we are being videotaped so you know be on your best behavior <laughs> I'm kidding <laughs> no 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 let's show them what Trinidad and Tobago is about because this is the first time Trinidad and Tobago is going to be participating in the global day of citizen action and we are representing right now we'll give them our flavor right um also there'll be f you can take photos you can take videos you can post on social media if you want to at any time during the event nothing that we're doing here is private um uh, we urge you in your contributions and in your discussions to leave partisan political positions at the door. And we're very serious about this. You know, th there's no need. I mean, there are a lot of issues out there right now. We don't need to, uh, you know, go into the details of some of those issues. We are looking at how can we uh, use the freedom of information strategically uh, as citizens to gain more space and leverage vis-a-vis -vis in our interactions with the government. Um, so, uh, so I encourage you to take part um, and to ask as many questions as you'd like when the floor is opened up for questions and let us help each other to take responsibility for bringing about real change in Trinidad and Tobago. Without further ado, um, let's thank these three guys and start the conversation for change. All right, well, thank you very much, Margaret, for your introduction, and welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the first, you know, hopefully a series of conversation for change. And I'd like to thank Mr. Afro Raymond and Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Maharaj, SC, for being here. I know the Hilton, initially in the broadcast, said 
hope you have an uneventful event, but we really hope you have an eventful event. <laughs> yeah, and not uneventful, to be very participative in this whole discussion. And well, let's, let's start one time. First of all, I'd like to ask both gentlemen, either one, um, what's your take on being recipient of this award, the Award for Civic Entrepreneurship, Mr. Raymond? Well, it's, it's good to get recognition, and uh, it makes one recognize how much more work has to be done because we're really facing a situation in which the lack of information has deformed our conceptions and our conversations. So we have a lack of information about the most basic things. How many people do the driving license test every year? How does that compare to 20 years ago? How many people fail the test? Does everybody pass? Is there any other country in the world that everybody passes? The most fundamental questions, and I'm not talking about property or clico, I'm just bringing a very mundane example, because just about everybody in the room has a driver's license in their pocket. How many people? Is it that they don't know now? We're going to get the information in six months' time? We don't know when we will know? And in fact, the absence of metrics, which is how I call it, I'm a surveyor by profession, and our profession is the science of measurement. The absence of metrics deforms the conceptions and the conversations to the point that all we could really talk about is this person's shirt and that person's toupee and somebody's goat and somebody's animal and all kinds of nonsense. We can't, we're unable to have a conversation. And in other countries, when you delve into the policy conversation, when you delve into the policy conversation, you are able, with a fair degree of ease, to find the information, okay? And I want to say something else, although I'm in the company of lawyers and I'm going to be brave and stick my neck out, <laughs> like I do sometimes. Feel I safe. want to say something else with relation to law and how law relates to information. Transforming the conversation about information doesn't only involve legislative measures. And I will give an example of something that I, I was startled to discover last year in March. I attended a conference at the University College of the Cayman Islands an anti-corruption conference in the Cayman Islands, imagine that. And it was actually entitled, Making the Caribbean a Corruption-Free Space. And one of the speakers there was a lady who was, at, the, at that time, the head of Transparency International. And um, that lady spoke about her visit to Brazil. And as you may know, Brazil has had these street protests, wide-scale, large-scale, fairly violent and emotional street protests going on for the last two or three years. The World Cup was a little lightning point, but been, it's been going on long before that. It will continue. And she said to us, very interesting, she said she saw something in Brazil that she hadn't seen anywhere else in the world, and this lady is the head of transparency, a French-Canadian lady, based in the, in, in, the, in the Berlin office of transparency. She said the people in Brazil had created a database. They had forced the government to create a database. I'm going to describe it to you in terms of let us describe. We have to get conceptual audacity grounded in facts so we can have a proper conversation. They had forced the government to create a database that anybody can go on to from anywhere in the world. We talk about open source and open data, and I'll talk about that more later and, and the impact of that on how our society operates and how our society thinks. They had forced the government to create a database that anybody anywhere in the world could go into at any point in time. It's updated every 24 hours at midnight. And you can see a line by line, I literally mean by line by line, tens of thousands of lines of information. How much money went, came into the government? For what? For motor vehicle licenses, for building permits. And line by line, how much money went out of the government to this contract for this contractor to build that bridge? Line by line. How did they do that? Because I could tell you something, as she told us to our astonishment. It didn't happen by any law. No lawyers were involved. Parliament wasn't involved. They didn't have to vote. The speaker didn't have to do anything. None of that stuff. Okay? The protests were getting more and more violent and having a bigger and bigger impact on the society. And eventually the chiefs, the political chiefs in Brazil, called in the chief protesters and said, what do you all want? What can we do to, to ease up this situation? And the people who had been protesting had the focus and discipline to have a wish list, a laundry list, some of us call it, call it of one thing they wanted. And they said, what we want, all those billions you have there, take a floor and put 50 civil servants in it. 
put 50 computers in it. And a month from today, we want that website. So the politicians started talking on Parliament and the Senate. And they, started, they said, we don't want to hear about that. You have the information. It's our information. It's our money. We want the information. And the Brazilians did it. It's not been reported in the international press. You could understand why. <laughs> because it's a, it's a, for certain people, it's an undesirable degree of transparency. For somebody like me, it's Nirvana. It's happening in Brazil, where a lot of the people look just like us. And they made it happen without the assistance of parliament or otherwise. So you have to have that conceptual audacity to understand that the obtaining information is not only through the channel, although we've been discussing the freedom of information as a channel, we'll be discussing that in the course of this afternoon's discussion. It's not only obtained through there. There are other channels that are lawful. They may be forceful. But there are other channels in which one could obtain the information we need to transform our conceptions and transform our conversations. I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Mr. Mouraj? That's my well, I am, I am honored, and I would like to take the opportunity of thanking the association and congratulating um, those who are responsible. But I am I'm, I'm sad that although you had a Freedom of Information Act in Trinidad and Tobago, um, it has not been used as it should be used. And the challenge was really for lawyers to give pro bono services and try to um, encourage people to use the Freedom of Information Act. It was the first time that people had a statutory right to get government-held information, which could be enforced in the courts. And it is sad also that the professionals um, have not come out and assist the communities what, what we need, I think, and, and, and it's what I'm still trying to become involved in, is a, a sort of um, public education program to sensitize people, especially the young people, to get them involved, to get them motivated in, in taking up some of these causes and helping people to be able to get government health information. Because if you cannot get the information or if you do not have the information, and if you have access to it but you do not inform yourselves, you will not be able to perform your role in a democratic society and would not be able to make government account more to the population. Now, Ms. Rose, in our opening remarks to, of, of you, mentioned that you championed many interesting pieces of legislation as AG, the Amendment to the Integrity in Public Life Act, Freedom of Information Act we're talking about now, Judicial Review, um, proceeds against crime. What motivated you to actually develop and, and move forward with these types of innovative legislation within our, our country? Well, as a young lawyer, when I came back to practice in Trinidad and Tobago, in practicing law, I realized that we had a very deficient system. And I realized that it needed legal infrastructure to strengthen the rights of people. Um, laws are normally passed to take away rights. And therefore, when I became an opposition member, I clamored for a freedom of information legislation and some of the reforms. So when I became attorney general, I felt that I got an opportunity to go to the cabinet with some of these measures. And I became very um, aggressive in the law reform aspect of it. I felt very strongly about uh, Freedom of Information Act. I, I, I saw the injustice which was being done, for example, a public servant could not get information on his file, which a public service held, and which they were operating against him at times, and he could not get information. If you were involved in a motor vehicular accident, and you went to the hospital, and you wanted a copy of your medical report, you couldn't get that. Um, it was a discretion which was refused on many occasions. If you had an inaccurate record in your file, in the public service, you can apply to correct that. So when I became the Attorney General, I felt this was the kind of legislation needed, and I also felt that you needed other legislation to strengthen the rights of the people. And that is why the Judicial Review Act was passed, in order to be able to make people enforce their rights, which meant that any public authority in Trinidad and Tobago, anyone which is unreasonable, which acts improperly, procedurally improper, or illegally, a citizen can challenge that, can go to the court, challenge, and get redressed. And I even went further in that piece of legislation. If you could not um, afford to go to court, or if you were, didn't feel like going to court, you didn't 
but there was an important issue which affected you, a group of public spirited individual or public spirited group can go on your behalf, but they do not have to show your consent in the public interest in getting the court to rule on the matter. And there are several other pieces of legislation which I, I, I don't think this is the time to talk about it. Yeah, yeah but surely, I mean, any, any, I mean, any administration would be fearful of trying to open up itself or government on the whole to public scrutiny. I'm sure members, co colleagues in the cabinet will have been fearful of this kind of attempt. But in some of the pieces of legislation, I got strong objections. But a country sometimes need uh, uh, an attorney general in a country under our constitution is a very important um, office holder. And the attorney general has to be very strong and has to know what his mission is, what the government mission should be, and ought to be prepared to take it through whatever it costs. As you look back now, being a former AG, is there any piece of legislation that you did not pass then that maybe you thought you would have liked the opportunity to pass that you do now? Sure, there were many, but um, my time was limited because of positions I took. Um, but I had, in the, I had in the pipeline at the time a law on referendum a law on referendum. And I believe that um, it's important to have that law because as it stands now in Trinidad and Tobago, the people have power once in five years. If you had a law which made it possible that in certain circumstances that the people can decide to have a referendum on a particular issue, even to remove a member of parliament, to remove a government, it could mean, it would then mean that during the five years, the people would still have power. But now, under the system we have, whatever a government does, you could have the best will in the world, put in the government, whichever government, and during the five years, even if the government misconducts itself nakedly, the people are powerless to remove the government. They have to wait for the five years to remove the government. I think that is wrong. And I had actually a draft bill, and it was in the process of being done, and if I had stayed probably six more months, it would have been law in Trinidad and Tobago. There was another piece of legislation um, which had to do with the protection of persons who expose corruption and misdeeds, a whistleblower legislation. Protection. And um, if you remember, when I was AG, we also passed the piece of legis legislation dealing with the Witness Protection Program, Justice Protection Act, which meant that we could have protected persons who were witnesses and judges. And for example, if I may quickly say, the Dole Chedi conviction and the gang being executed would not have occurred unless we had had witness protection program because all the witnesses were killed and an accused person was taken and was made a witness and I cannot tell you where he went because that is top secret, but he was sent out of the country the gentleman had two wives. We had to send the two wives out of the country <laughs> with his children. But he gave the evidence as a co-accused. And um, I think. so uh, I think whistleblower legislation is very important because um, if people want to give information uh, in order to, let's say, expose corruption, they have to be protected. <clears throat> and the whistleblower legislation, which I had in draft, was that they, that person would not be liable for any criminal, even if he was participating at the time, he would not be liable for any civil matter, criminal matter, or any disciplinary matter. But that has to be supported by a proper witness protection program. Well, interesting you mentioned whistleblower, because you're also known as being a whistleblower yourself uh, in 2001, in terms of the stance you took in the then administration. Looking back now, some 12, 13 years afterwards, would you have done anything differently? Or no, would you have done the same no thing? as a matter of fact, I have no regrets. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you remember, when I went to be interviewed in, to be a candidate in 2010, I was asked by the political leader of the UNC, the, who became the partnership, um, if I became the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago again, and there, was, um, there were allegations of corruption against the government, what would I do? I said, I will, I will like, even expose it with even greater force. And, well, Mr. Ram Logan became the Attorney General. I did not. <laughs> <think so. laughs> 
<laughs> so I would have, I would have had no regret whatsoever. All right, there's one last question. Because, I mean, as, as Margaret have mentioned, I, I work in the Freedom of Information Act and the Freedom of Information Unit. And England only passed the legislation like 10 years after, after ours. Yeah. And one of the persons who was in, instrumental in that was Tony Blair, former mm-hmm. Prime Minister. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, though, after he be, demitted office and he became a citizen, there's autobiography, which is most Prime Ministers do autobiography, I guess, after they finish office. He said one of his, one of his regrets was the actual passage of freedom of information legislation in the UK. Looking back after you've demitted office, do you have any regrets? No, as a, as a matter of fact, I feel very proud that the freedom of information legislation is one of the matters that any time I have to go to it, I feel very proud that I've done that for Trinidad and Tobago. And if I remember, I think it's the only country in the Caribbean which has freedom of information legislation. Next to Jamaica. Next, Jamaica has it. Ja- Jamaica that's has enforced. It. Uh, um, it the Cayman it, Islands has it. That's enforced. It, it, it had it before us? No, no. no, no. Oh, we no. came first, then Jamaica came. Yeah, that's what I thought, yes. Yeah. Uh, other countries have it. I think Antigua Barbuda has it also, but it's not. It's just law. It's not it. enacted. Yeah, yeah. So there are only two countries in the Commonwealth Caribbean that has it, Trinidad and Tobago and, and Jamaica. And one of the things I remember doing in the legislation, because I had experience... I mean, the law, and I knew that how it could be. I, I decided that whatever exemption, the court would have the ultimate power in deciding whether, even if it is an exempt claim, an exemption claim, the court can decide whether it's in the public interest. Mm-hmm. But what has happened with the legislation is that it has become too bureaucratic in that there are a lot of technical objections being taken. Um, there's a lot of delay, and any government of the day can frustrate it um, because, well, can help to frustrate it because what can happen, they can use lawyers to create all sorts of objections. And if it is that you take everything to court, what it means is that you can discourage people from using it. And if you do not have a legal profession which is assisting with, bro, pro, with, with <coughs> pro bono work in doing these matters, it makes it very, very difficult. And that is why I think that it is very unfortunate in Trinidad and Tobago, I might get into trouble for saying this, it's very unfortunate in Trinidad and Tobago that the legal profession does not understand generally that its job is not only to go to court and do cases, it has a responsibility to the public to educate, to assist um, in doing matters like these. I want to congratulate Mr. Raymond um, because he has led the field in, 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 in in a very important case which I think would be a landmark decision in the Caribbean in the freedom of information legislation. I think there, there, there's one which has been filed in the court of, and it's now in the court of yes, appeal. Yes. And there is one which is coming up to be heard in the high court. Yes. But it shows that how that, that, um, that act with the provision that the court is the ultimate, the ultimate decider as to whether it's in the public interest was really a good thing to have done. Now, as, as you mentioned, Mr. Raymond, um, one thing I've always actually wanted to ask you, why did you want to get involved in civic activity to begin with? I mean, your profession, professional by trade, I, I think I read in, in, your, in your bio that you've you lectured in your real times and member of a board in different capacities. Mm-hmm. Why take the chance to be a civic activist? Well, I just felt it was necessary because, you know, they have that old-fashioned saying that... Um, <laughs> to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think I've been, I've been given a great deal um, in, in different things for my family, my teachers. I had super teachers, um, really, really super teachers that got me where I am today. And of course, some of the professional people who mentored me. So the point is that we're not going to get anywhere by ourselves. You know, life, life could be seen as an individual journey, but we get there together. You know, no man is an island. So I make the effort to improve the collective Okay, uh, the, the effort to get involved in this is a very serious decision because you're exposing yourself to all kinds of um, criticisms. I have not felt myself in any kind of danger or threat, but you do get, you do get threats um, professionally in terms of the flow of work and so on. The flow of work is okay, you know, it's all right. I think that there are really important things to be carved out here. Uh, the two cases that Mr. Maraj talked about are the CL financial case, which, which I'll talk about more later, and that is the largest ever 
expenditure of public money in the history of the country. There's nothing close to it. It's 25 billion and counting. Okay? And nobody knows where the money went. Now, if you can't trust public officials, and I'm not speaking about any particular administration, because they all paint it with the same sort of brush, really, only one or two exceptions. If you can't trust public officials with $1 million, and you can't trust them with $2 million, how on earth could you trust them with $25,000 million? And that's what we're dealing with. With relation to Invaders Bay, which is the, the other case we're doing that is now in the appeal court, and that, that comes up for hearing on the 26th of May, we're dealing with a ministry that has decided to develop state lands, arguably the most valuable parcel of land in the country. It's waterfront land in the west of the capital. It's flat land, it's service, it's lights, it's water, it's got access to the highways. And they're doing that in a process that is in breach of the law. The current law relating to ministries issuing tenders is the Central Tenders Board Act. And the Ministry of Planning became involved in a whole circuitous process, the legal word is circumvention, which just means to sidestep and duck. There was a calypso at Cali, but they were ducking. Yeah, Tiwari was ducking. Yeah? And they were ducking the law in an attempt to do a large scale development. Everything about it is improper. There's not one thing about it is improper. Everything about it is improper. And the most improper thing, like the icing on the cake, or in fact the cherry on the icing, is in fact that the minister claimed to have legal opinions that vindicated what he was doing. That's a popular word this week, vindicated. The <laughs> minister claimed to have legal opinions that vindicated what he was doing. And when we asked the minister to see those opinions, we asked him three different ways. He was never able to show them to us. So in fact, we have this very strange creature now. You see, we, we don't want to talk about animals, but we are a strange creature. It's got a body looking one way, and it's got a face looking another way. So the history in the past, the pattern of conduct in the past in our country has been that an issue will arise, and the government will get opinions on it, whichever government it is. Sometimes they're legal opinions, sometimes they're technical, they're engineering, economic opinions. And generally speaking, I mean like 99 out of 100 times, if the opinion supports what the government is doing or what they want to do, they publish it. They get up at the post cabinet briefing and they tell you that XYZ prominent lawyer, sometimes they would quote um, the former president, Ellis Clark, or Mr. Daly, or whoever, somebody from England, or somebody would quote somebody, this person said this, and what we're doing is right, and so on. So we have a pattern, an established pattern of behavior in the country, whichever administration is there, that you obtain opinions on the issue in question. And if your opinions support what you're doing, you very calmly get up in a press conference, and basically this position is, I was right. And you explain why you were right. It appears in the next day's newspapers. But at Invaders Bay, and this is why it's a, it's a creature with a body that looks one way, <laughs> and the face looks another way, like that calypso. We won't go into that. But at Invaders Bay, we have a creature where the body, we've been told that the body supports what they're doing. But the face of it is that they can't publish it, because they have the right to withhold it, and blah, blah, blah. Well, I say no. I say that is our land. It is being developed with our money. It is supposedly being developed for a public purpose. And the organization I have the honor of being president of, which is the Joint Consultative Council for the Construction Industry, which is an umbrella group for the construction, real estate, and property industry in our country. We took litigation against that decision to withhold that legal opinion, those legal opinions. We were successful at the High Court on the 14th of July last year. And we achieved what I would say, and I guess other people would opine on it, Mr. Maraj may opine on it later. We achieved what resembles a landmark victory because we had a government holding to the principle of the privity, the confidentiality of a legal opinion, what is called legal professional privilege. And we had the court weighing legal professional privilege against what is called the public interest test which is contained in the Freedom of Information Act at Section 35. Mr. Maraj wrote a good, a good act. Section 35 has a lovely public interest test. And when the court weighed the two things, the judge eventually ruled that in a matter of this importance, the public interest would prevail. Of course, the government at once jumped into appeal mode. And we're in the appeal court. Our next hearing is on the 26th of May. 
and we're going down fighting. Okay, we're fighting on that principle of whether or not our land and our money and our development, supposedly in our interest, could be any kind of secret. You know, there are other issues to it, but I'll leave it there for now. But those are some of the things that, that, that animate me. And we need to have those issues ventilated. You can't, you can't get that kind of progress that we want to get in our time in private and in secret. Okay? Silence is the enemy of progress. We can't get it that way. Now, you and I, when I was part yes. of the mission, we, we conversed a lot. We like, did. On telephone, never, never of in course. person. First time we met was, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so my, my personal question to you is this. As a citizen, we've mm -hmm. heard Mr. Mirage talk about the reasons behind FOI and the purpose for it. Yes, yes. I and mean, I could go into the reasons as being as, in, in, myself as to the, the importance it plays citizens getting access to information in the government. But as a normal person, mm -hmm. how difficult or easy it is to get information from an, a normal public service? Well, it depends. Let me just start off by, I'll start with you. When you were there, and I forget the exact year, it was maybe 10, almost 10 years almost, ago, yeah. when you were there, at Mr. Mr. Maraj was head of the Freedom of Information Unit. And I used to pick up the phone and call and ask to speak with him. And I used to get him. He used to take my call. And he would help me. He was actually somebody who was, I felt he was committed to answering my questions, informing me, assisting me. It was clear I was speaking with somebody who was no lawyer. But he was really working. I didn't mean to say that. That, that came out wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's just, it's just to make sure you, it's just to make sure you don't fall asleep. I, 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 keep you alert, right? <laughs> I didn't really mean that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's clear I was speaking with someone who was, who was committed to assisting me. And it was a pleasure speaking with him. And it was equally clear <laughs> a little while later that he was no longer there. I don't know whether what happened. I mean, I, I, I met him for the first time when I came into the room this evening. So it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, it is a pleasure to meet civil servants who are committed to working with the public and, 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 and doing so in, in, a really, in a really straightforward way. So he was, he was one of those people. Now, taking it forward into the, into the depth of the question you asked about how, how easy and how difficult it is, it depends. To give a Trinidadian answer is according. If you, if you get, we had a situation here. Let me give an example. Let's talk about a current case. We had a situation that was on the front page of the Sunday Guardian two Sundays ago about our our complaint, our illegal actions by the Ministry of Justice in relation to the construction, our being JCC, about the Ministry of Justice in relation to the construction, or the proposed construction of judicial centers, which are courthouses, courthouse complexes throughout our country. And we had a meeting with Minister Volney, 1st of May 2012, a big argumentative meeting. We wrote him on the 7th of May 2012. And he never replied to it. It was a long letter, about 11 or 12 pages long, detailing what our concerns were about the project's illegality and the, the improper use of public facilities and so on. And uh, I followed that up with a freedom of information application from the JCC to the Ministry of Justice. But the tactic, one of the tactics that we, we, we're exploring with some success is uh, there's a limit to how much you could get out of the politicians. Because really and truly, it's a little bit of a kind of a, um, you know that game at the Savannah where they do like this and they move it around and then the thing is under this one and it's under that one. It's like a little bit like that. So in fact, you may have targeted this politician for a particular line of questioning and a month later the person is not there for whatever reason. Another person is there and that person will look you fixed in your face and say, well, I wasn't there. That was before me. That was, that was Tom or that was Betty. So in fact, what we have taken up, at a certain level of the struggle, we change gears and we, we, we target the permanent secretaries. So I targeted the permanent secretary with the Freedom of Information application with a list of questions. And to my astonishment, she took, she took two months to answer. It's the section 15 of the Act says you have 30 days to answer. Mm -hmm. But she took two months to answer. To my astonishment, that individual uh, on the letterhead of the Ministry of Justice under her signature confirmed in writing three legal things the Ministry of Justice did under a different permanent secretary, if you see what I'm saying. A different permanent secretary had done it. It happened under the administration of a different permanent secretary. And the one who was sitting in the seat at the moment, who had been in the meeting, the hot meeting we had with Volney, and was obviously very uncomfortable. When she got the FOI, which gave her the legal window to speak the truth, she did. So, for example, she confirmed that there had been no technical review of the of the development brief before it was issued. She confirmed that it was a sole selective situation. 
in which there was no tendering for the professional services. She confirmed that they paid over three million Trinidad and Tobago dollars in professional fees, when in fact the ministerial committee has a limit of one million dollars under the Central Tenders Board Act. And I have that in writing. And that formed the platform for us to go to the Central Tenders Board, the Integrity Commission, and the, um, and the DPP. And that is how that ended up on the front page of The Guardian Sunday, two weeks ago. So in fact, it is according to who you answer, who you write to. In relation to CL Financial, one of the biggest documents I've ever gotten under the Freedom of Information, the biggest, grandest, the most, explains the biggest scandal in the history of the Caribbean. I got it under the FOI after eight months with no lawyer. I was writing to the Ministry of Finance to get a copy of the CL Financial Shareholders Agreement. That was signed on the 12th of June, 2009. And there was a press release from the Ministry signed by my good friend and my colleague, Conrad Enel, who was sitting in for Nunes the at the time. And it, the, con the contents of that press release made me very uncomfortable. It said certain things I wasn't happy with. So I wanted to see the shareholders' agreement. So I wrote to the Ministry of Finance, and again, I took the same avenue. We wrote to the PS. I didn't worry about the Minister of Finance, because those are politicians, and there's a kind of a way that they deal. That you could deal with them at a point, and then you have to change gears and change from them. And it took her about six or eight months, but um, that permanent secretary, she's now retired, Alison Lewis, that permanent secretary sent me the whole shareholders' agreement. And the shareholders' agreement lays out in graphic detail the scandal that we are dealing with because we have a shareholders' agreement in this country. Let's explain what it is. The company was bankrupt. They were on their knees. When they approached the central bank, it was a scenario that in the financial and commercial language, you described the central bank as being the lender of last resort. In other words, nobody else would lend you any money because you were so broke. It's like when you leave home and you have to go back home to your parents and ask them for money. And it's a question of pride. Nobody else would lend them any money. So it's like a, a, a version of reanimators or vampire movie. They just had enough life to crawl up to the central bank and ask for money. And we were told that the money that was being accessed for the Treasury was being accessed. This is in the bailout of January of 09. It was being accessed to assist depositors and pensioners and all of that, all of that comfortable stuff and granny and tanty and those kinds of things. Only to discover on the 12th of June 09 that they had signed the shareholders agreement that in fact promised in writing under the signature of the Minister of Finance and the shareholders of CL Financial to restore the shareholders. And wait for it, you're going to see it soon. The only place on the planet, this is the only place on the planet that they had an agreement like that. To restore the shareholders, the shareholders were down to zero. That company could have been bought for a dollar. That is the commercial and financial reality of what that means. But we had a Ministry of Finance here in June of 2009 that signed our treasury over to restore the shareholders. That's what we're dealing with here. And this is why I'm, I'm really involved in our campaign to explain this to the public. We have a public, and I'm not speaking to anyone here in particular. I'm just speaking about a public question. We have a public internationally and nationally that is financially and economically illiterate. We have to become literate. Time to get down to business, mental, mental self-defense and fitness. We have to get down to it. Understand what it is. our country at stake. It's our money. And deals are being cut. So on that occasion, that, minister, that, minister, that permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance gave me the document. I didn't have a lawyer's letter. There are other times when I've used lawyers and we go on and on. Round and round we go. Where it stops, nobody knows. So it depends. If, if I may yeah, just... Sure, um, sure. It's, I'm glad you said that because mm -hmm. when we were drafting the Freedom of Information Act, mm -hmm. um, the, there was a lot of suggestions that we should not make it so simple and they wanted to make it that you had to have a lawyer's letter. And that is why you'll see in the Freedom of Information Act, you do not need a lawyer's yeah, letter. It is a form, yeah. It's a form. Right. Mm -hmm. And you do not have, at, um, if I might show you, you do not have to pay a fee. No, it's free. It's free. It's free. Yeah. You know, it's free. Um, because it, the whole purpose of it was for members of the public not to have to go to a lawyer. You only go to a lawyer, I suppose, when it is refused. Yes, yes. And you need the help of the legal profession. Mm -hmm. And there's where the legal profession should have mm -hmm. been more accommodating. But, but my question to you, Mr. Maraj, afterwards, Mr. Raymond, mm -hmm. do people understand their rights under the Freedom of Information Act? 
And I promised it on this point. While I was there, I mean, I can be fine, but it starts well from 2007 till 2012. I think the average amount of freedom of information requests you're getting in any given year was about 120, 130. And of all the freedom of information requests that have ever been made within the years that the Act has been working, one particular organization alone, one single organization alone, gets about 75% of all the requests. And I'm sure nobody here in either you all can tell me which organization that is. It's the Public Service Commission, yeah. which means that public officers are utilizing the Act a lot yeah. to get information, I guess, on themselves. Because as you mentioned earlier, yeah. before the Act, a lot of pub people, public officers had problems seeing their personal file mm -hmm. and other personal information about them held within the state. So a lot of public officers are using the Freedom of Information Act to get information on themselves. But that aside, 25% are from normal citizens on the street. That can't be enough. Do people really understand their rights under the Act? I don't think that a lot of people are aware of the power they have under the Freedom of Information Act. And I do not think that um, people have really utilized it as it should. And that is why I say that it probably needs a very proactive public education program in the communities. And the networking has to be really in the communities. Because if persons are explained, a lot of people do not know that if they go to the hospital to get a medical report and they cannot get it, the doctors cannot uh, say you can't get it. Um, so I think that what is really needed um, is for the younger generation, if I may say so, to get involved because this involves the future of the country. And a, a lot of this information which can be got, what Mr. Raymond is talking about, can assist in dealing with issues of misconduct in public office, corruption and abuse of office. As a matter of fact, um, I don't know if you remember in whatever year it was, I can't remember, but the information that I saw on Clico which was being hidden, I, I thought that action had to be taken. But if that information was outside to the public uh, over a period of time, I think the members of the public would have been able to understand that um, this situation should not have developed. And if that action was taken by the government, I belong to at the time, probably we would not have had the Clico problem that we have now. But information is important, it belongs to the people, it is owned by the people. It's government held information, but the people own the information and the government holds that information in trust for the people. Mm -hmm. So the people are entitled to the information. Mm -hmm. The problem we, having, we are having is that people are not sensitized to the need to use it. And you cannot only blame the people. I come back again to the professionals and especially the legal profession. This should be a challenge for the legal profession to get more involved in helping people to use the freedom of information. As a matter of fact, in my experience, as a practicing lawyer now, what I do, I get the information from the public service first. And when I get that information, then I advise the filing of the judicial review application. Because in judicial review, you do not get disclosure from the government. So if you have the information, and you even write the pre-action protocol letter, it is very difficult for them to contest the matter because you already have the information. But if you write them, they try to suppress the information and sometimes the information disappears. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, um, it's true. so I hope I've been able to answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. Do you think people understand? No, no, yeah, I right. think that is the reason that the lack of understanding, the lack of general understanding about the Freedom of Information Act and its potential is one of the reasons that I would take a pause here to congratulate the colleagues who have made the effort to establish this group disclosure today. This is very important because it, 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 it resounds with Maraj's point, Ramesh's point, about the, the responsibility of professionals to assist the broader public to understand what their rights are, and in fact, what the possibilities are within the law, of course. So that's, that's a very important step, a very commendable step. I con congratulate you. I, I, I am appreciative of the fact that you're recognizing my work on this occasion. If I could say something about the act and about the operation of the act and, and yourself, your own role 
Rishi. One of the things I've always considered to be a tantalizing possibility, playing around in the back of my mind in that place where I play with things that could be and should be and so on, is the whole question of how does the act operate? And how can we introduce management techniques to make the act operate better? I had suggested some time ago to some colleagues of mine, it doesn't matter who they are, that in fact we need to have a freedom of information application into the Freedom of Information Act. So we need to, have a, we need to be able to construct a matrix that says, since this act came in, how many applications were made? To whom? What's the average time it took to respond to those applications? Which are the ones that went to court? Which are the ones that went all the way up to the Privy Council? We need to be able to construct some kind of a matrix to understand how this whole thing operates. Once we have done that, you'd be able to identify the ministries or the public agencies, which in fact have a, a good performance in relation to the Act. So they possibly are ministries or agencies that consistently respond within the time limit of 30 days given in Section 15. What are, the, what are the methods those ministries or agencies are using as opposed to other ministries or agencies? Now we introduce any concept of benchmarking in management. Okay? How do we actually get a continuously improving public service and continuously improving public administration in terms of our channels for citizen participation? So in fact, we need a freedom of information process ongoing into the freedom of information process. That's what we need to do to get to the next point of understanding what it is going on. Okay, and this is why an organization like the one that you all have, you all have come together to establish, could, if, I, if I could suggest to you, could play an important role in that, to bring some concrete information forward. Because I know I'm from a family of, I'm a, I'm a descendant of a family of civil servants. I don't have any contempt for the civil service. I was a civil servant myself for years. I know that not everybody in the civil service is evil. Or bent, on, or bent on cheating the public. I understand that. That's my family. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not any, any hostile person to the civil service. But wrong is wrong and right is right. And we need to have a systematic, data-driven method for singling out those who are performing and those who are not performing. Let's go back to the beginning of the discourse about the discourse that we continue to have that lacks hard information. Therefore, it affects our conceptual ability. It, it affects our ability to have a proper quality conversation. So we need to apply that to the act itself, as opposed to applying the act to things external to the act. The act itself and the unit itself needs to be subjected to that kind of scrutiny so we can take the performance up to the next level. Well, I mean, to defend the unit, I mean, I know we do do... I was, I was not attacking you. <laughs> there are, you know, I was there just are, saying. There are, there are, I mean, we have a website, www.foia.gov.tt. Sure. Even mm -hmm. though I'm not there, mm -hmm. I'll still plug it because it's, it's close to my heart. And we have all the annual reports that were done, I think, up yes. to 2010. Yes. That at least gives you some statistical information on how much requests were made for that particular annual yes. year. Yes. The agencies that got them. The time frame that took less than 30 days, more than 30 days. Yes. But I agree. We do need to do some more. I mean, while I was there, one thing I wanted to do was to do an evaluation, a proper evaluation mm -hmm. on the Act. Because, I mean, the Act was passed in 1999. Yes. A lot of countries now have gone beyond and have done different things with the legislation. At our, we are now, whereas before we were the forerunner, mm -hmm. now we've, we're lagging behind. That's true. And maybe we need to now reevaluate freedom of information or move it to... The new term now is access to information, yes. or the right to information, and see what other countries have done to bring us now up to that, to that standard. I mean, I know one thing that we, we've attempted to do with regards to data protection legislation, the Data Protection Act, which deals with the protection of private information, is that we propose to set up an information commissioner working on the model of the UK. And the UK has an information commissioner, which is a separate independent body mm -hmm. that administers both data protection and freedom of information. And if somebody fails that they are grieved by a decision of a public body, they can go instead of going to court, which is always a last resort. They can go to the Information Commission to seek redress. And the Inform Information Commission has a lot more teeth, one. Information Commission, it's cheaper because it's, 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 it's a public sphere. So that's the approach we took with regards to data protection, that we've moved the freedom of information appeal legislation away from the ombudsman, because the ombudsman really has no say. I mean, the access that public authorities could, if they want to yeah. listen to the ombudsman, they will have to take on the ombudsman. Mm -hmm. Vote away from the ombudsman so that you're now appealed to this information commissioner who can then look at your case. It's going to make it a little more easier, but those are still things that I know they are currently working on, so I really can't get into much. But that's was us. Mm -hmm. At least while I was there, we proposed that we move away from the ombudsman to this information commissioner while still having the court as a matter of last resort. 
Now moving away a bit from freedom of information a bit. I'm moving more now into your civic activity that you're both well known for. Why are civic societies not taken seriously in this country? Why is it? I mean, something I've always asked. I question myself a lot, even while I was in university and now. Why is it that we have to burn tires in the street or, or block a road to get notice, Mr. Murray? But in some cases, you have to do that. But I don't agree that civic societies are not taken seriously. I, I, I think that they are taken seriously, but I think that what has to happen, they, has, they have to be, um, I think they have to be more unity with the civil societies and the civic societies. Um, quite recently, I started a, 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 got a group of young people together, and we started an organization called Democracy Watch. And um, there has been a lot of interest in it, but it's to get the young people involved to actually do the work, which has become a problem. And I think if we can get the young people involved to become involved as they were involved in the 1970s and thereabout, I think we can have a very powerful civic society movement in Trinidad and Tobago. But I think you have very good groups in Trinidad and Tobago, very important groups. And I think the, even the trade unions do a very good job. Um, and there may be a time coming in Trinidad and Tobago where all these groups may have to get together and unite in order to defend um, you know, democracy and et cetera in Trinidad and Tobago. But I think that, um, I think, we, we need to find some way how we can sensitize the young people of this country, if I may say with the greatest respect to the younger people like me. But we have to find some, some ways to um, sensitize the young people of this country. Well, I, I would agree that the civil society organizations have an important role to play, and they have played an important role. I, I think about some of the efforts we have made in relation to the Freedom of Information Act, which is, a, which is JCC, which is a com combination of civil society organizations. We have, we have made some progress in relation to procurement law. That is not, that is not something we're here to discuss today, but that was a, 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 a unity of eight civil society organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, JCC, Transparency, and other organizations like that. So it, it's possible to make progress on that front. The, the, danger, the danger I want to, to talk about in terms of the civil society, the area that I think we should be alert about is the whole question about what I would call the whole question of dismantlement. So we have discussed Mr. Maraj's initiative and his energy in getting these important laws passed, and I have always recognized that, and it's, it's good that it was mentioned here. And of course, we're discussing some of our perspectives on it. But one of the things that we, we must discuss on, on, this, on this sort of occasion is the sort of efforts that have been made in the past to dismantle those gains and to get a clear understanding in terms of how, how things go, that when you get something like a Freedom of Information Act, a Judicial Review Act, an Enhanced Integrity Act, a Prevention of Corruption Act in a single administration, that is not an accident. That is a tide in the affairs of men, to use a poetic phrase from the past. That is, a, that is a particular champion in the cabinet, pushing and insisting, and putting it on the agenda and all of those sorts of things that one has to do to get something through in that collective context. And you need to understand also that just as somebody like Ramesh Maraj is visible, or somebody like myself is visible, there are equally powerful or more powerful people who are invisible. Okay. We're discussing an intersection between a world that is seen and a world that is unseen. And the boundary between those two worlds is where we have the contest. We're discussing a world in which the very Freedom of Information Act that we're discussing here, there has been a, there's been a, a serious assault on it. Another assault I would, I would delineate. There's a TSTT case, Magdalena Samaru versus the TSTT. The attorney who litigated for Magdalena Samaro was the former attorney general, Mr. Anaram Logan. And uh, Mrs. Samaro was litigating to get a particular document out of TSTT. She litigated in 2006, Mr. Manning was in power and so on and so on. This is one of those pieces of litigation like that. And uh, it was alleged, to use a popular phrase, it was alleged that the Integrity Commission had written a letter 
to the board of directors of TSGT. Giving them what in Trinidad and Tobago we call a bligh. Giving them permission not to follow the law. Mm. It was alleged. And the, and the permission was given in the context of TSTT having taken up litigation in 2005, I'll get to that later, against the very Integrity Commission and the, and the remit of the Integrity Commission. So the Integrity Commission, helpfully or otherwise, was alleged to have written a letter to the directors of TSTT. Ms. Magdalena Samarova, Samaru, whoever she may be, took up the lawsuit with Mr. Ramalogan's assistance, and they won the case. And the turning point in the case, this is where it gets interesting. Eh? This is not me rambling on. It's a very interesting point. The turning point in the case was, what is a public authority? The Freedom of Information Act describes a public authority because the people who are under the umbrella of the Freedom of Information Act are public authorities. What is a public authority? A public authority is something that's under the control of the state and that is funded by the state. Justice Carlton Best, the late Justice Carlton Best, he's passed on now, in that 2008 ruling, ruled that TSCT was a public authority. There's a list of state enterprises in the Ministry of Finance. He found it on the list. Whenever they have to appear before the Joint Select Committee, the minister is there and the permanent secretary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The judge cited all of that in his ruling. Mm -hmm. And he made the point that TSCT must be a public authority. Therefore, they must provide the information. Of course, the case went straight off to appeal because, as I said, there's a, there's a visible world. This is like astronomy, and there's an invisible world below the surface. People who never show their faces. And I'm coming to a point. It went to the appeal court. Of course, as we know, the partnership won the election, and Mr. Ram Logan became the attorney general, as, as Ramesh Maharaj said a little while ago. And uh, another lawyer took over the case for, for Mrs. Magdalene Samaro. And that case was disposed of. That's the word lawyers use. It was disposed of on the 28th of October 2013 in the appeal court. And the disposal of that case is something that is quite remarkable. So, the judges got together that day. And I, I obtained the transcript of the hearing because there wasn't a ruling and there wasn't a judgment. But there was a conversation in the appeal court. And it's a transcript that's only one and a half pages long and it's truly remarkable. <coughs> and the judges tell the litigants that, listen, we've read everything. And we understand that you, want, you, you don't want to continue this case. You want to discontinue it. And you want to settle costs out of court. Because that is what they do. They, they, they compromise the case, which means that they settle the case outside the doors of the court, yes? And the judges then did a remarkable thing. So they agreed that the case wasn't going to go on anymore. They agreed that there was no need for a ruling <coughs> or a judgment because both parties weren't suing each other anymore. And then... The appeal court judge said, and that precedent in Justice Best's ruling, he's speaking to the TSTT. He's speaking to the TSTT attorneys. He said, that precedent in Justice Best's ruling that is causing you so much difficulty, we would extinguish it. So the ruling of Best in 2008, that TSTT is a public authority, under the remit of the Freedom of Information Act was extinguished by the appeal court in a case where they made no ruling or any judgment. It happened in this country, 28th of October, 2013. And what is the importance of all that? Why am I beating up over a small thing like that? Let me tell you why it's important. I'll put it in a bigger context and I'll bring it to today's context. The bigger context is this. The biggest deals in the world the hugest deals, infrastructure deals, construction projects, commercial deals are being executed today by means of a vehicle, a series of vehicles called public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. TSTT is a public-private partnership. We need to get economically and financially literate here. And if TSTT as a public-private partnership well, we already know the appeal court decided on the 27th of June, 2013, that TSCT is not a state enterprise, right? So they're not under the Freedom, they're not under the Integrity Act. That was in this country. And the 28th of October, 2013, as a follow-up, it's like a one-two. They extinguished the precedent that was causing them so much difficulty. So in fact, TSCT 
is not under the Integrity Act. It's not under the Freedom of Information Act. And at this moment, let's take a stop and consider the bacchanal that's taking place inside TSCT with cable and wireless and what's happening to our country's telecommunications and the critical importance of telecommunications to take our society and our economy to the next place. We do not have a window into those conceptions because our Freedom of Information Act has been extinguished. It was a conception that was causing them difficulty, you see. Very helpful. And the Integrity Act was extinguished 27th of June, 2013. That's where we're sitting now. So when you see the communication workers beating up on a point, when you see me beating up on a point, and I have a whole tab on my blog about the integrity threat, and the threat the country is facing to our fundamental economic interests. This is no joke, you know. This is very serious. This is about our future. And we have to get this right. That Integrity Act needs to apply to all of those bodies that are publicly funded, even if it's a penny. And more to the point, all of those bodies are transacting public money. So even the bodies, because if you're not careful, let's take a stop. If you're not careful, a little bit again, they will tell you that FCB is not under the Freedom Act. Think about it. Because it makes a profit, so it doesn't take any money from the Treasury. It's only part of the shares owned by the government now, right? Because we own the other part. Okay? So a little bit again, I'm making a sketch for you about the impact and the implications of these things. And to bring it in context in terms of our economic and our financial understanding about our own country's interests. That's what it is at stake here. Okay? It's a very, very important. Don't let anybody fool you. I'll never forget those words. He was going to extinguish a president that was causing TSCT so much difficulty. So the fact the notion that TSCT is a public authority under the Freedom of Information Act has now vanished from our law books. Fortunately, on my website, you would find www.afroraymond.wordpress.com. You would find the Carlton Best Judgment, which is not online in the TT Judiciary website. I had to get a scan of it. Okay? Think what you will. And... Uh, the transcript of the hearing of the appeal court of the 28th of October 2013, they're both on my website, which is under proper protection, warehoused outside of Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> which is part of the information war. Okay? If I may yeah. just... Uh, Understand that. It's, it's the reason why I have always said that in any democracy, the judiciary forms an important part and without the judiciary enforcing the law or properly interpreting the law to give effect to what is stated in the act or, or, or not determinating with the spirit of the legislation can pose a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have been educating people about in Trinidad and Tobago is the whole question of Caribbean Court of Justice and Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Now, I don't want to change the topic, but if you look at the decisions of the Privy Council in politically sensitive matters from the Caribbean, you'll see a different kind of decision to when you look at judgments from the Caribbean in the, in the various courts of appeal. So uh, you, you could have the best law in the country, but it's very important for democracy, for the judiciary to be able to discharge its functions because if at any time in any country a judiciary becomes a, a part of the government then you do not have any democracy well i i, I would love to continue this conversation more by nowhere press for time and we also want to open the floor to members who want to ask questions but before that i would like to ask one last question of both yourself and mr raymond it's a visioning question 10 15 years from now where do you see Trinidad and Tobago? Well, it depends a lot, in my view, to what happens. Um, well, what would you like to see for Trinidad and Tobago? Oh, what I would like to see for yeah. Trinidad and Tobago, I would like to see that we're able to get young people to understand that the future of this country depends on them. And when you look at the issues facing Trinidad and Tobago, the economic issues, the crime situation, openness, transparency, accountability, the issue of official corruption, misuse and abuse of power. Um, if this continues without uh, the young people getting involved and show that they are sensitive and they want to save Trinidad and Tobago, we are going to be in serious trouble. Well, I, I would echo those 
those sentiments. I would put Trinidad and Tobago in context in terms of our, our role in the region. We have a big, we have a big footprint internationally. Yeah? When you go outside and you meet people, thinking people, educated people from other parts of the world, India, Africa, China, those places. Trinidad and Tobago is a place that has an impact and people know about it and they're interested in what happens here. I can remember being astonished 25 years ago meeting certain people, certain brothers and certain sisters and certain comrades from Nigeria, from a radical, radical movements in Nigeria, who every week used to read OWTU's Vanguard. OWTU's Vanguard makes its way over the waters. And I'm not discussing internet times like now, because the internet is really 20, 15, 20 years old, they get to the power it has now. I'm talking about before that. Those people in Nigeria used to order OWT Vanguard to see what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago and be able to discuss a point with you about Trinidad and Tobago. So we have a presence, okay? I think that the Caribbean civilization, such as it is, offers a tremendous promise to the world, to the globe. Trinidad and Tobago is a big society in that space, although we're small like that. If we get it right, in terms of our racial mix and the prosperity of the country and our sensibilities, if we get it right, there's tremendous hope for the region. If we get it wrong and we have to fight hard to have a fruitful conversation, to have stability in our society, to change some of those old fashioned and, and, and dirty ways that we conduct ourselves in public life and private life and so change some of those ways. If we get it wrong, we're really discussing a terrible sort of outlook for the region. We already have a region that is, that is largely outward looking in terms of the, 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 the repatriation of funds and the people being in, 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 in the first world and so on. We have to develop more of a South to South understanding. That is something I'll be doing some work on shortly. South to South understanding. What is a learning we can get from Africa? What are the best practice lessons of, of what's happened in Africa? What are the best practice lessons of what's happened in the Indian subcontinent? And they really are best practice lessons. People look at Trinidad and Tobago as exemplary in certain things, and we just keep on going, and it, it really is, the burden would really be on the younger people. I see some of you here today, and that's very encouraging. So I would leave it that I very much um, find myself in accord with Mr. Maraj. I will thank you very much, gentlemen, mm -hmm. and I'd like now to pass it on to Mr. Anya Alexis as we open up the question and answer session of this segment this evening. Oh, thank, you, sure. thank you, Rashi. Okay. Um, if you want to ask a question, we would invite you to raise your hand, and we have two gentlemen to the back that would walk around with the microphones, and they would hand you the microphones. Okay? Oh, sorry. We'd also like you to state your name and the organization that you are representing as well, if you are from an organization. A question over here. Good. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank both Mr. Maraj and Mr. Raymond um, for sharing. My apologies. Um, my name is Keston Perry, and I am a research student at the University of London. Um, I want to thank both of you for sharing um, a much of the knowledge and experience you've, you have. Um, I think I want to make a point about history. Um, I think a large part of the deficit you're mentioning between the kind of activism that happened um, back in the 70s and even earlier in the 30s, 1930s, that wasn't too long ago, um, is as a result of the fact that us younger people, many of us do not understand that history. And many of us aren't taught that history to a large degree. Um, I, I first learned of Lloyd's best name when I was in postgraduate studies at UE. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. And that is to tell you to a very great degree where that, the kind of learning and the kind of activism and the kind of things we would like younger persons to be involved in do not come from, I was actually having this conversation on Facebook today with a, with a trade unionist about why it is there is such disengagement between our population and the political directorate and the political structure that we have. 
Um, and I think it's, 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 it's to, to that point, because if you, if you don't understand the kind of, kinds of struggles that Uriah Buzz Butler, that um, Lloyd Best with, the, with, with Tapia and, and these kinds of people have had, how would you understand now that you, when, I mean, I'm not going to make this political, but it is a political point, when our leader of opposition is basically summarily removed from parliament and you do not engage the political directorate and understand that that engagement is important, how, there, 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 is, there is very limited things you, you can do without that level of understanding. That's, a, that's all I want to say. I didn't realize that. What? I didn't realize that they're not taught these things. No, they're not. They're not. <laughs> don't think, uh, don't no, even uh, know what uh, uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. But you're, you're correct. Before, I, I mean, I know, I mean, my, my, my dad was heavily, he wasn't involved in the Black Power Revolution back then, but as a young boy, he would actually run away from home and go and take part in it. I was born in 1977, way after the Black Power. But I was telling my dad, I make the point to him that the essence and the the lessons learned from the Black Power Revolutions are no longer felt today. And you would always ask me, say, well, no, because we got black people couldn't be in the bank back then and couldn't be in airways. And I said, I understand <coughs> that, that the changes that were made. But at the same time, the, the energy that we had back then, it's, it's lost on a generation today. Why, why, why is that? I mean, it's, it's actually a question I had to ask. But we have another question here now. Uh, good evening, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sheldon Maiku. I am from the Faculty of Law at St. Augustine, University of the West Indies. Uh, my question is a type of amalgamation, <clears throat> excuse, of two comments made earlier by Mr. Raymond and by Senior Counsel uh, in the context of this, the dismantling mm -hmm. of our institutions. Mm -hmm. um, our democracy is based upon the rule of law, separation of powers. Um, where the government, legislature, the judiciary, uh, the executive, is, the rules and functions are, while they may overlap, it's, it's supposed to be separate. My question is, <clears throat> in the context of the dismantling of yes. the current legislation, yes. as well as some of your concerns in your council with regards to the Privy Council as against the CCJ, over the last, I would say, I wouldn't want to go as far, as far back as four years, but it could be before that as well. What we've seen is a, a, a serious blurring of the lines in terms of the separation of powers. And the judiciary appears to be severely compromised. You see it in the headlines every other day. How, how do we address those challenges, seeing that the judiciary is really the the, the foundation upon which our democracy is, is built in, in terms of that being that check and balance against the, the actions of the executive and the legislature. How, how do we make the public aware of conceptually what our democracy was built on? And how, how can we come up with innovative strategies to take our democracy forward in the context of the balance against uh, the balance of Caribbean jurisprudence as against uh, decisions made in the Privy Council. How, 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 how do we, in terms of your experience, how, how do we navigate those waters? It's a lot, eh? It's it's a very sensitive area, hmm. and it's not easy for governments and people to deal with it. Um, but if we go back in history a bit, when we were becoming um, a republic country. Um, a lot of pressure was being put on Dr. Eric Williams, who had the requisite majority in the parliament, to um, get rid of the Privy Council as a final court of appeal. And he resisted it. And people were surprised he resisted it. And if you go back in history, he was asked, well, how it is you go in republic, uh, it will be contrary to sovereignty and nationalism. And he said that, what's the defect, that justice is an international issue. It is important for people in a small society to believe that they get justice. And he said words to the effect, 
everybody goes to cocktail parties in Trinidad and Tobago. And he would like to accede um, to the popular view of having the Privy Council as the final court of appeal. Um, um, but that does not affect the sovereignty of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, when I was Attorney General, we had to decide the question also. And the question came as to whether we should uh, um, break away from the Privy Council and have the Caribbean Court of Justice. I took the position and I advised the government that the concept of the Caribbean Court of Justice is a very good concept. But the issue of justice is not an issue for politicians. It's an issue for the people and the public must have confidence in the administration of justice. So what we can do is that we can have a system that you build the confidence and you have appeals from the Court of Appeal to the Court of Appeal. You have some appeals and you still maintain some appeals to the Privy Council. And over a period of time, people would have confidence. And then you have a referendum for the people to decide whether you want to abolish the Privy Council or not. Now, I can tell you from the experience I have as a lawyer, I have the greatest respect for the judges of Trinidad and Tobago. I have a very um, good relationship with the president of the Caribbean Court of Justice. But when I take cases from Trinidad and the Caribbean, and some of these politically sensitive matters, and when the decision occurs in the Caribbean, and I get one type of result, and when I go to London in the Privy Council, and it's a completely detached court, I get a totally different result. And the results that I get in England are more in keeping with, generally more in keeping with promoting the rights of the individual. I cannot help but feel that something is radically wrong. So that is why recently I have embarked on a public education program to try and teach people about some of the important judgments that you have in the Caribbean and some that you have in England. For example, something that will affect parliamentary privilege. As a mm. matter of fact, I told, yes. I told your lawyer about this um, yes. two days ago, right. Mr. Kingsley. Yes. I had a case in St. Vincent, the former commissioner of police, a man by the name of Randolph Toussaint. The Prime Minister, Mr. Gonzalez, went to the Parliament and decided to acquire his land and give the reason in the Parliament because Mr. Toussaint was opposed to him when um, he was opposition leader. So in effect, what he said was, I'm acquiring the land not for public purpose, but to get personal revenge. So we filed a constitutional motion to set aside the acquisition. We applied, we, we applied for the transcript of the House of Representatives there. We put it in the, parla in, in the court. Mr. Gonzalez's lawyer take the point that that is parliamentary privilege. It cannot be used by the court. The court cannot look at it. The court cannot see it. The court cannot rely upon it. I went to the high court. The high court judge disagreed with me. I went to the court of appeal. The court of appeal judge disagreed with me. I went to the Privy Council. The Privy Council decided parliamentary privilege was to protect the, par the parliamentarian from not being sued for anything they said in court. But it's not to be used to suppress evidence to assist people to show that the prime minister was misbehaving and misconducting himself in the parliament. Mr. Tuse then won his case, got compensation for his land. So without the Privy Council, Mr. Gonzalez would have been able to say what he wanted in the parliament. We had another one just the other day. I think you, you, you would have seen it. Mm. A former prime minister James of St. Mitchell. Vincent, yeah. Sir James Mitchell. Mm -hmm. he, uh, Mr. Gonzalez appointed a commission of inquiry. And he was not, um, he didn't give any evidence as yet. And in the middle of the inquiry, the commissioner sends a secret report to the director of public prosecution. In effect, asking for Mr. Mitchell to be locked up. I filed a, a motion saying, well, this commissioner is biased. And there's a former judge of the Court of Appeal in the Eastern Caribbean. He's biased. Went to the High Court. The High Court said, no, the fact that he did that, he's not biased. And I couldn't think of anything more biased than that. <laughs> Went to the Court of Appeal, and I was amazed after arguing it for days. They reserve a judgment, and they said they agree with the High Court. So James Mitchell wanted to know what is going on in St. Vincent. There's a man who served the country in his own country, went to the Privy Council. Within 10 minutes, sitting in the Privy Council, he touched me. He said, Ramesh, 
this is a different place to St. Vincent. <laughs> I get injustice. <laughs> The Privy Council stopped the inquiry, said it's bias and etc. Quite recently in Trinidad, municipal police officers, mm -hmm. municipal police officers went to court. Government breached their rights. The court, the high court ordered where well, they should get damages. The Court of Appeals said no, no damages because the damages are too speculative. So if your rights are violated, you suffer for but. 20 years violation, you're entitled to get some compensation. Went to England. The Privy Council decided, well, since 1800 and something, judges are deciding cases with damages, even if they are speculated, that's a function of the court. Mm -hmm. And they ordered the people to get damages. So I could go on, on and on. In 1975, I'm sorry that, uh, in 1975, <laughs> I was a young lawyer. Take notes. I was a young lawyer, and a judge was doing injustice to my client. So I went before the judge. I said, my lord, you're guilty of unjudicial conduct. He said, contempt of court, seven days simple imprisonment. The senator asked me to apologize. I said, no, tell the judge that um, I will ask for 14 days. I said, anyhow, to cut a long story short, courts in Trinidad and Tobago, no, no redress. The Privy Council, I got redress, and the decision was, not even a judge could violate the Constitution, and the state um, is immune from liability. If the judge violates the Constitution, the state must be. I want to, I want to, yes. I want to just come in on this question for a second. No. I want to just come in on this question for a second, uh, Mr. Tanku's question. I think it... Maiku. Maiku, I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, Mr. Tanku is the Prime Minister's secretary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, Mr. Maiku, the question I want to come in on, I want to come at a different level from Mr. Ramesh Maharaj. Ramesh Maharaj was, was elucidating on the difference between the treatment of the Privy Council and the Caribbean Court of Justice. But I think you started off at a very interesting point because you talk about the separation of powers question. And I, just this week, I was having a, a hard debate with a friend of mine about it. The, the separation of powers question is really like a kind of one of those urban myths. So we think we've seen it. And we all know somebody who saw it. But could anybody actually show you a photo of it, like the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> so we're here in Trinidad and Tobago discussing the separation of powers. And we have the classic formula of um, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. And we discuss it like that, you know? When we go to classics classes, and we do university, and so on and so on. But in our parliament, the way that things run in Trinidad and Tobago, just about, and certainly for the last 15 years or so, just about everybody who's a member of parliament for the government in power is a member of cabinet. So in fact, half of the legislature is in the executive. Right? Right or wrong? Correct. So what are we really talking about? It's a fusion. So it's a, kind of, it's a kind of mathematical question. When you get down to it, and you write it down on a piece of paper, take a clean piece of paper and write it out. Or like new maths, when you do these things where the lines intersect, and you know? What is overlapping with what and thing? It really makes no kind of sense. It's a fusion. It's not yeah, it's a fusion. It's a kind of, it's a, confusion really is like that. Okay. So we don't have much separation. And you've, you could witness it. So for instance, just to give an example, segueing on this point we're talking about, we're talking about FOI. We're talking about these integrity and transparency provisions in our law. Because this, this is the kind of discussion we have in here this evening. I can remember very clearly. Let's give a date. Let's give a year. March of 2009. The Attorney General at the time was the PNM administration, was Bridget and he said, George. And that lady brought to Parliament, I don't know if the word is motion, but an amendment, a proposed amendment to the Integrity in Public Life Act. And the proposal was to make the Integrity in Public Life Act become the sort of act that, in fact, if you want to report wrongdoing by a public official, you have to give all your particulars, your name, your address, you have to put the statement in writing, you have to sign it, yeah. Of course, there was a howls of protest to the point that some of the members of the opposition who are now in government had to be put out of parliament. But that was a serious submission, or some of you may say, and the, the, the rationale it was put forward on was one of those flim-flam things where, in fact, you say that, in fact, if you don't do this, people are going to muddy people's names, 
and, and as a public official, you're going to be accused of corruption and it's going to be out there and you were accused of this and you were accused of that and people can just make anonymous reports about you. But then again, you pause and you say, what is crime line? What is 800 tips? When you could pick up the phone, if you look out of your window and see somebody locking somebody's neck on your street and you could pick up the phone and report, hey, I'm seeing somebody locking a fella's neck across the street and it's two guys in red t-shirts or it's two guys in yellow t-shirts or whatever color. And this is what's happening. And you could make an anonymous report of a violent crime. But we were being told in May 2009 that an anonymous report of white collar crime was somehow of a tremendous threat to good order. So that was another attempt at dismantlement. It soon failed because a number of us wrote about it and, and mashed it up. Fine, fine. It soon failed. But you've got to be vigilant. Let's come back to the question about the civic society engagement. We've got to be vigilant to preserve the gains we have made in our country's framework. I have a couple of questions. I think, I think we'll have you see. Oh, sorry. I'm not you sure. You've got a question? Yeah? No, I think I'm not sure. This one, yeah, and then we'll take you. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Uh, Novak George, I'm a citizen of the Republic. I don't represent anybody except my friend, myself, and I'm a friend of Afros. Um, there we have it. Couple of points. First of all, uh, some of you may or may not know that um, there's something called the nixontapes.org. Check it out, it's brilliant. What it is is as follows. As you may recall, Richard Nixon, that fine bastard, um, <laughs> recorded everything from 1960, whenever, when he was, it first became president, until that. a few short weeks before he um, had, had to quit. There was a voice activated tape recording happening continuously in the, um, in the Oval Office. And he recorded everything. And um, nixontapes.org is an organization whose job, whose mission has been to transcribe these tapes. It's over, it's over 4,000 hours of tapes. So imagine the transcript. They're rich, they're unedited, they are the most accurate, unencumbered version of what the political directorate is thinking. It goes further. Nixontapes.org also has the Kissinger transcripts. Mm -mm. Uh, you all can figure this out on your own online. It's brilliant. But here's the be beautiful thing about it. Nixon taped everybody. And so did Henry Kissinger and neither Nixon nor Kissinger ever told each other. This brethren, eh? this is the National Security uh, uh, Secretary and the President. Nixon's method was different. Um, Nixon had technology, voice activated. If you're in the Oval Office and you're talking, you're on tape. Kissinger was different. He had listening devices and he had two secretaries who were transcribing everything as they go. So when Kissinger <laughs> left, public office, he, um, he destroyed the tapes, but he kept the transcripts. And he gave the transcripts to the National Archive with the um, proviso that they can't disclose anything in his lifetime. Hmm. And a bunch of civil society organizations in the United States went to court against Kissinger and the National Security Archive to say, nah man, these things happened during the Cold War at a time when we need to know what was taking place, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Kissinger is on the record. We won those transcripts. And after a generation's battles, if you go to nixontapes.org, you can see the transcripts of what Henry Kissinger was recording. And you can see the transcripts of what Richard Nixon was saying. Some of it not very flattering, but all of it in its pristine original condition. In case all of this sounds like it's just mere history, it's not. Um, last week, Bangladesh sentenced to death a bastard for genocide. And the, where the information resides as to his genocidal craziness is from those tapes. So imagine the pain and suffering of a generation. I can put it to rest because they got the information. So you can thank the bastard Richard Nixon for that. Um, two other points. A question for the gentleman. What do you think is the responsibility 
of the civil, civic society agents to build up the practice of using the freedom of information um, legislation? How, how, can, how can the civil society actually drive the behavior? Because I think what makes, what would make the political directorate get better is the vigilance that's around them all the time because everybody is FOI in them out of the XYZ. Because if you if you bar wrong four sides with FOI to the nines, you'll either behave or get out of politics. It's that simple. Uh, so I think that's that's a, a one question. And I have one more thing. Let me just I, I wrote my notes on my phone. That was just uh, Somebody mentioned something about black power. Royal Gibbons and they did a processional on black power remembered and reenacted. Um, I was there for one, it's brilliant. What they did in a nutshell is, they did a thing on stage and halfway through they say, okay, enough of this. Everybody get outside and walk around like the black power protests. And so I'm the generation immediately after black power and everybody who was walking around was several years younger than me. They were flipped out of their mind because they didn't understand that you actually had to walk around to protest. You don't just click a link and click that you like something. <laughs> it's not as easy as it sounds in practice. <laughs> you want to say to everyone? Not at all. Not at all. Yes, so, yeah. Anybody want to, to respond? No, it's okay. We'll wrap it up. Got a question on the side? Okay. Yeah? Yes, all right. Um, afternoon. Um, my name is Olabisi Kuboni of the Constitution Reform Forum. I would want to start, first of all, um, I don't know if I'm in any position to question uh, Mr. Ramesh Maharaj. Yes, you are. His, um, you are entitled to. <laughs> <laughs> and what he had to say. Um, obviously, well, for one thing, one cannot deny the facts of the particular situations that you talked about. I, do, I don't think in a position to do that in terms of uh, what happened uh, at the local level in terms of the Court of Appeal and so on, and the difference as um, came up in the, um, in, in the UK. Um, what came to mind as you were going through all these examples for me, in particular the one, uh, the, the original one that you said, I think that, um, oh, it was Afra, um, about TSTT not being a public yes. organization, public, public organization. Mm -hmm. Here is an institution, in my mind, our institution, our judiciary, where it is possible to erode the fundamental principles on which the, govern, the, gov, the, 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 the nation functions. And one could do that legally. Mm -hmm. um, so that to me is the issue. Yes. Not whether we're supposed to keep the Privy Council. Because if we have uh, a practice where the, the professionals are consciously using the, the legal things available to them to erode and destroy and degrade um, our institutions, then that to me is the issue to be addressed. And it is not really whether we have to keep the Privy Council or not keep the Privy go to go to the, the Privy Council. That that is not the issue. Because I, while yes, this whole business of justice is international, I don't know if I agree with that as much as I feel strongly of the fact that justice belongs and is interpreted within your local space. It has connections with the international, yes, but it's first, the first place where it gets its meaning is in the value system that you have where you are in your local place. 
And to me, that is what we have to get right. A word that came to my mind as both of you were talking is the issue of self-regulation. That seems not to be something that we pay attention to. But a society, the democracy of, of, of um, an institution and a society rests on the capability and the awareness of uh, us regulating us. And uh, you asked the question about civil society organizations. As belonging to one of them, not as grandiose as um, <laughs> JCC, we weak. Okay? But I think that civil society organizations have a role to play as far as this business of regulating of the society. Right? Um, and if I come back now to where the discussion started, at least where I picked it up, sorry for being late. Um, uh, you mentioned something about moving on to the notion of the right to information, um, and other places seem to have moved on to that. My readings tell me that as well, and not just freedom of information. Um, <clears throat> and what was going through my mind in a kind of a hazy way is, uh, what would it take to build a culture a general culture in the society where we recognize and make demands um, for our right to information. I think one of the, the, the obstacles towards us accessing the Freedom of Information Act is probably because uh, we do not see ourselves uh, having the right to have information. And if I don't have the right to something, I ain't going for it. Because, you know, it, it's, it's not my right. I, it's not something that I have any right to. So why, it, it's not going to come, come to my head that I should go through any process, you know, to, to get that information. The reason why Afra is doing all that, because he knows within himself, that it is his right. And if you don't have that, then it is not going to happen. So therefore, one of the things that we have to, to, to try to work towards as uh, civil society groups, as an individuals, conscious individuals, is building uh, this notion that we of the right to information. One of the things, and I'll, I will end here, that um, concerns me, um, and this might be treading on dangerous ground, <laughs> is uh, the role of the media. Hmm. Um, and uh, what, and we see the, the, the media in terms of uh, providing us with information that, uh, you know, the, the political directorate would prefer to hide from us. And in particular at this time, as we're moving towards uh, mm -hmm. election and so on, um, we're getting a lot of it, you know, from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am concerned sometimes that... Uh, we may be calling information what is really bacchanal and scandal. <laughs> and therefore, to what extent is that blocking us from really developing a culture um, uh, where we place an emphasis on our right information. That's it. You want to, I, can, I can say something. About you can say one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just just to bounce with you a bit, Ola BC and um, Novak. I know you were asking about the, the civil society and the whole question about information. 
I want to bounce with you a bit on, on, on a question here. One of the interesting things about the whole question of primary information and education, I know our colleague there is from the university, the chap I was just speaking with, and some people here from the university community. So we have a society that is considered to be literate, it's considered to be educated, it's considered to be a thinking society, it's considered to be a learning society. And of course we've produced beautiful works of literature and art and all of these sorts of things. These are concepts in our minds. My question is, what actually happens to information? What information do we generate? To be really purist, what information do we generate? And I'm going to speak about the things that are closest to my work. So we have a, a succession of commissions of inquiry into matters of high public concern. I just recognize, you know. And that's happening. And what's happening is that mostly those reports are suppressed. I'll take you through it. It's interesting. The reports are suppressed. So we have this kind of paradox where the Commission of Inquiry is conducted on TV. So you can stay at home and look at it or turn on the TV at night and see it. See this person being questioned or that person squirming. There's one going on now. I'm not going to talk particularly about that one. And uh, the off inquiry, which was between 2008 and 2010, was the first time, at least as far as I know, that we were able to force or to demand that a Commission of Inquiry report be published as soon as it was finished. Okay? And that was a report into the public sector construction industry in our country. But people have called it the UDCOT report because most of what they looked at concerned UDCOT and Mr. Kola Hart and certain allegations against Dr. Keith Rowley and so on. Now, the report has been published, and there are two interesting things you should understand because this is a conversation about information, and this is a conversation about the world we see and the world we don't see. And again, it's like astronomy. Some of those things are so big, like black holes, they even suck the light into them, but they're so big that they influence the course of the things you can see. Let's talk about off. So the two things to understand about off. The first thing is that there were 91 recommendations. And despite all the political promises, they've never been implemented. 90 of them, let's get this right, 90 of them could have been implemented without any requirement for parliament. 90 of them are what I would describe as administrative measures. One measure, one of the recommendations, number 56, was about the new procurement law and it required mm -hmm. parliament and so on and so on and so on. 90 out of 91. And I can tell you, about 85% of the, of the stealing and the waste that we've had to endure would have been controlled and stopped. Okay, so that never happened. So that's the first thing we need to understand about us. The second thing we need to understand about us, because it's a funny old world we live in. Pro Professor Off was an Englishman, he's an engineer, He's a QC, he was the chairman of the Commission of Inquiry. And he did an innovation that was very welcome for us, those of us who live in it, one foot in the cyber world and one foot in the real world, in that he set up a really beautiful website. The Bernard Inquiry, which is the airport, didn't have a website. Off had a website, so you could go up there and pull off the transcripts. So if you wanted to see the transcript of what I said, you could pull it off and read it, print it, make extracts from it, use it as a reference for your research, and so on and so on. They were streaming, the testimony was streaming, it wasn't, the stuff wasn't um, archived up there, but it was streaming. The transcripts were there, and the witness statements, and so on. So in fact, as far as I'm concerned, the information in what I would describe as the off proceedings was a treasure trove. If you're a learning society, and I'm throwing this challenge out to the younger people here, and you would like to count us as a learning society, let us reflect on it. It concerns areas as diverse as government, talking from a university perspective, public administration, political science, accounting, finance, economics, law, engineering, surveying, town planning, urban and regional planning, the Institute of Business, the MBA, the ACCA, all of those things are involved in what took place in the Alpha Inquiry. All of that information was housed on the website. It was www.constructioninquiry.gov.tt. And I could tell you what, six months after the current government was elected, that website stopped functioning. 
the information is gone. It's a very serious state of affairs. So let's relate back to my first statement about here being an educated society and a learning society. How can we have these institutions of learning? We have two universities in the country now. There's more than two, but two principal universities. We have so many educated young people. And what are they learning? If you don't have primary material, let's talk scholarly for a second. What are you reading? A book about somebody else's book, about a review of that book. And what about what happened in Trinidad and Tobago? There's real stuff that took place in this country. There's groundbreaking stuff that took place in this country. We took stands that mattered. Those things were documented. Those people were cross-examined under oath, under TV camera. We participated in those, in those inquiries to make a difference in this country and to bring those furtive things into the light. And they certainly were brought into the light, which is why they've been made to disappear now. Like in Star Trek, when they beam something up, and it's just, it was there and it's not there. So in fact, we were involved in, 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 in a series of correspondence between Mr. Herbert Volney, between, um, what's the other lady, Chrislyn Moore. On one occasion, Chrislyn Moore him wrote and told me to tell you the kind of thing that happens. She wrote and told me that the reason that she couldn't publish the proceedings from the off inquiry was because the government was considering criminal proceedings and to publish it would prejudice the case that they were going to some kind of lawyer, lawyer thing like that. Something that had been on TV twice a day for the two years. <laughs> Something that was on the internet. And it's nothing but garbage. And we have to get the conception, stand up straight, walk straight, hold your chin up high. We are educated people and we insist on the primary information about our country. I don't want to read no book about what anybody else did. What is, where's my book? And why has it been made to disappear? And let me give you a last warning before I close off. Right now, we are wading through the finishing stages of the Coleman Inquiry, the Coleman Commission, which is the Commission of Inquiry into the Collapse of CL Financial and the Hindu Credit Union. The Hindu Credit Union report was delivered. It's 382 pages long. Justice Coleman delivered it. No, sorry, just, um, yes, Justice Coleman delivered it in October last year. It's lodged in Parliament and it's there. 382 pages about Harry Hanna right and the Hindu Credit Union. I think the CL financial part of it is going to be much longer. It's supposed to be ready in a two or three months or four months or something. It's going to be much longer. It may be a thousand pages or more. It's going to be substantial and there's going to be a tremendous amount of learning in there. Things that we must understand if we are not to make those same mistakes again. But I, I am assuring you, and this is where we get interesting about the bond, between what is seen and what's not seen. I'm assuring you of my belief for making a prediction. If we are not vigilant, if we are not careful, one morning we would wake up, quite likely after the report is published, quite likely after an election, and discover that the Coleman Commission website has also been extinguished. So we need to be careful to preserve our gains. When I spoke about dismantlement, and we were, we were dialoguing on dismantlement and, and civil society, so we have to be alert to that. The whole of us disappeared. And if you're not careful, if you look sharp by Christmas, Coleman will be a distant memory. You know, they have some fanatics, I had some partners, and off every morning, he was about four o'clock in the morning, taping the whole thing. And I thought it was Kixi. I used to talk to him, I said, why are you doing that? And he said, boy, I just taping this whole thing. And he was right. And in fact, I myself run a website with my colleagues, some of them are here. And coming down to the end of off, I wasn't yet chairman of JCC. When, when he had made his report and so on, it was just published by John Jeremy and so. As we say in Trinidad, I get a vibes. And I tell my partner, I say, hey, what? Download everything there, you know. And my partner, Lego bought on them. There were things that they called bots. See, Lego bought on them and he taped everything. And I could tell you, I have a copy of everything. And at the correct moment, I'd be republishing it. I have a copy. And somebody else has another copy too. Somebody with no name. So, <laughs> we disclosed it today, but not today. <laughs> not all the way. But in fact, the powers that be have discontinued the subscription or whatever. And the link is dead. So we have to preserve those gains. I, I, think, I think that is why we all have to be vigilant. And, and there is a need for all groups to be vigilant. And um, I'm not criticizing anyone, but sure. I think the educational institutions like the university, I mean, I used to always admire the aggressive and proactive role of the guild of the University of West Indies. And now we have more universities and yes. for some reason it's not there, it's not happening yeah. and um, yeah. I think there, there, there must be a reawakening 
there must be a, um, an igniting of the spirit. And it may be that's a greater challenge to all of us, groups, individuals, to do more in order to make people more aware and sensitive to get involved. Because after listening to what you have just said, it, mm -hmm. we have just remained silent yeah. on some of these important reports. Yeah. And a lot of taxpayers' monies have been spent. Millions. And millions. then you'll have the same mistake in government and in public offices occurring after and after. Mm -hmm. And no one is made accountable. No, no one is punished. No. Um, no one property is taken away. No one proceeds of crime is taken away. You have all the best laws in the land to operate against some of these things. And no action. Mm -hmm. I, uh, just we have time for like two or three more questions. If you guys make a point quick. We have one yeah, quick question. One in the back, and we yeah. have two here. Yeah. Evening. Um, my name is Christopher yeah, Rafferts. Um, Let's make it as quick as possible, please. Attorney at Law. Um, question directed to Senior Counsel. And I thought you could come into as well. My concern is basically that with the FOIA Act itself, that I find of recent it has become more of a shield. And I say a shield for mm -hmm. transparency and accountability, a shield against yes. transparency and accountability. Yes. Um, myself, very quickly, too, as well. I mean, I was part of a system where I was, worked for a particular ministry. And we actually had to sat, we actually sat down and our job was actually to go through the exemptions and chalk mark off what the exemptions were, send it back to you. We look at the form of the application. We tell you, look, you have no signature on it, um, blah, 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 good, back home. Good. And then you have to go find a lawyer. And, and that public interest thing works against you because if you don't have the financial means to get a lawyer, then that's it. So the quick question is, um, senior, how do we rein in the exemptions? What can we do? Um, to, to bring that law to be able to defend us properly and, and seek out the intention and the purpose of exactly what the Act is supposed to do? Well, the Act really needed um, assistance, legal assistance, for persons who are refused information. Because you have, to, you have to find a formula as to when the public authority refuses information, what do you do? And in all information regarding states, you have to have a balance. Mm -hmm. You have to protect some information. They will ask to be exempted. But the only place or the only institution which you can depend on to do it independently and in a, in a just manner is the court. And therefore, notwithstanding all the exemptions you have there, <coughs> notwithstanding all that you have there, the court in any matter has the widest discretion to override the exemption. So it really needs legal assistance. And that is why I believe that the legal profession, the legal profession owes a responsibility in the absence of legal aid um, to give some of the time. It may be that through the law association, there could be a condition. In England, for example, lawyers have to do pro bono work yes. as a condition yes. of being able to practice yes. annually. So I think what should happen here in the absence of funding by the state, approach should be made to the law association for the law association to make it, um, to take steps to encourage lawyers and to probably make it a mandatory for a certain period of, of the cases, yes. but a certain number of cases, yeah. that you'll be able to help do some of these public interest matters. Because without that, it is very, very difficult. As a matter of fact, I have now before me a, a, a witness who was in the witness protection program. He signed a form when he went into the program. They discharged him from the program. And he gave evidence in a very important murder case. They discharged him from the program, so he had no protection. He had threats over his life, and he went back to them, and they refused to put him back in the program. A letter was written, um, a, well, a, an application was made, and they are refusing to give him information for him to file a case in order to get protection. So, and they are using the public interest point. Hmm. Now, what has happened when the case was filed, the government retained about 10 lawyers, mm -hmm. right? Take all sorts of technical objections. Mm -hmm. And the court um, is still processing the matter. So I could, I could, I, you know, I sympathize with the point you have made because I see it in operation. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be what we should have done is to probably put a, like an information commissioner 
or an information of ombudsman and, and be able to put some pressure upon the ministry um, with at least publishing certain things and the information ombudsman might be able to get it, but you still have to have a right of appeal to the court. Um, when we were doing the equal opportunity legislation, that is what we did, the equal opportunity yes, tribunal, yeah, yeah. and then we put it to the court. But there are still problems there. So they, it's not an easy balance, but I think that this, I do not know if you know this, but the international ethics and duties of members of the legal profession um, include giving lawyers, the, um, give, uh, lawyers given to the public the duty of going in the communities, helping people to understand the law, the rule of law and democracy, and taking up on popular causes, pro bono, to assist the community. Pro bono uh, offerings of the legal profession, the disclosure today offers precisely that, pro bono assistance to the public in seeking to obtain information. And we'll be talking a little more about that. Oh, we, have a question yes. of a, we have a question on the side here. Good evening, everyone. I am Tiuka Dove, Trinidad and Tobago's representative in UNDP's Caribbean Youth Think Tank. My question is simple and straight. We speak of young people in participation. However, having engaged many young persons, they have strong opinions and a willingness to take action, but are deterred in doing so by fear. Fear of victimization, slander, and most importantly, loss of employment and income. What advice would you give to those young persons? My, my advice, um, Tioka, just quickly, to, to say to you straightforwardly, that is the reason, that's one of the benefits of association. We have a constitutional freedom of association in our, in our country's constitution. And the benefit of it, from my point of view, is that we can get together. So for example, we have an organization like the one I'm in charge of, JCC, which is made up of other organizations. Individuals belong to those organizations. Those organizations come together to form our organization. And you select someone, in the case of JCC, it's myself or my predecessors, you select someone who actually is in his circumstances and have a mind to speak to the collective grievances of the people. You cannot always have a situation where individuals have the frustration or the intestinal fortitude to speak out. That's not going to work. You have to associate, whether it's in a trade union, and I know that there are trade unions for people who are in the public service, whether it's in a, it's in a group of artists or a group of writers or something, you need to associate and make the practice of behaving, of, sorry, of conducting your, your grievances within associations. That's what I would suggest. But in addition, to, sorry, um, uh, no. yeah. uh, um, but in addition, I think that this is a real problem. Yes. It's a real problem because the government has been extended in so many fields. Yeah. And this is a real fear. I, I, I agree with you. Um, People are afraid um, to take up, even to associate. And you see it in, you would expect, you know, professional, professional some lawyers are afraid. Mm -hmm. I mean, you will go to some lawyers to take up a case against the government. And the lawyer said, no, I'm not doing it. Um, and that is not the duty and function of a lawyer. The duty of a lawyer should be fearless, independent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so fear is a major problem in the society today. And, yes. And, um, it, it may be that um, these persons could assist in different ways. They may not be able to come openly, but they can assist in different ways in the battle. They can assist with the, um, with the communication. They can do different things, and other people who are brave enough can go forward. But um, have, there is a role for one to play, even though one is not vocal in the forefront. And we have one, and we have two... Three more questions. I just, I just had a, a comment. David, you have one here. Oh, yeah. Yes, David Walker. Um, not so. Yes. Okay. It was basically um, a comment in continuation with what the young lady said, and to add to what um, senior counsel, Mr. Well, Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Murad said. 
including or thinking about the fear, it's also a matter of the example that's being set for us. It's a matter of integrity. It comes down to mentorship. It comes down to there are a few people that you could look up to and say, okay, I can follow this person. But, but in actually getting it done, we live in an information age where there's so many things coming at us daily, weekly, and you have to decide, you have to really have conviction and you have to really know what you want in order to be able to stay focused in a particular area that might be a particular area that is to improve the country, create change, something like that. Because you, you're telling me you have a, a, a political regime or a group of people that are supposed to be setting examples for us. Mm -hmm. And continuously, the news is packed with, I want to say the, the R word, the rubbish word, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say what I'm saying. It. It's not something that is going to encourage you to be somebody that can actually stand up for the right thing. I mean, I don't, I don't know if the right thing or the wrong thing is the right word to say, but something that is, something that is integrity filled, something that is to bring your world or your nation up to the point and the standard is So you'll be focused on things that are not focused on Trinidad really and truly. You get, you get involved in the media. I grew up on the media. I grew up with TV. I grew up with social media. I grew up with everything. Things like that. People, I haven't actually, most of the things that I know about values and about actually coming to work on time and behaving a certain way in the workplace and honesty and things like that are from what I decided to pull from observing people. Not everybody has a personality that's strong enough to pull the right things. And then when you look at the leaders and you see that the leaders are doing it, the exact same thing, what are you going to do? If, you, if you're not that type of person to say, okay, this is wrong, this is right, this is what I want, and I and stand up for that, what is going to happen to you? You're just going to be in the, the, the big group and follow the crowd, and then it's just going to be, and, and, and when I'm saying this, I'm not talking about education, and I'm talking about being able to get A's. I'm talking about being able to make decisions that would actually impact people positively. So you will go to school, you will get all the A's, and then you will observe all the, the corruption, and then be like, all right, well, everybody doing it. I am focused on, on making a way for myself and making money for myself. I'm going to do exactly what they are doing, because I'm smart enough. And I mean, if you're smart, you would do what everybody else is doing to succeed. You're not going to do what the people who are struggling to do doing. You're not going to do that. You're going to do what everybody is doing, and they're getting away with it. So. So the, I, I'm sorry for being controversial, but this is basically the way I see it. And then after a while, the people who actually have the positive thoughts or the positive push forward, they're going to become disenchanted. They're going to not be interested anymore. They're going to find other things, and they're just going to get lost as well. And my name is, sorry, my name is Ria Nelson. I'm, I'm representing young people this afternoon. Hi. Yeah. Gentlemen, the same. Yes. The, the, the four people I think that we yeah. really like. It's one, two, one, two, three, three four. four. And, and that's let's it. try to continue the questions maybe over cocktails, but we okay. do have another I, little I, thing I to will, do. I will be brief. Yeah, thanks. Um, David Walker, independent consultant. I wish to slightly elaborate on two things that Afra said. The first was that we have tremendous learning and academic opportunity in relation to what has happened here. The situation that has arisen with Clico and CL Financial presents an academic opportunity that does not exist anywhere else in the world. We have a unique situation. Mm -hmm. We are taught in most professional courses that a regulator never runs a company that it is supposed to regulate. That's correct. Uniquely, in my experience of 30 years in the financial sector, this is the first time I am aware of a regulator running a company that it, it regulates. Where is the academic research into the consequences of that from UE, from UTT? Never thought of that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, the regulator in this case is the central bank. Central bank, yeah. A further point about the central bank, which to, to my mind explains, I, I go a bit further than Afra, the deviousness of the constructs that was used in order to avoid the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. The central bank is exempt from the provisions of the Freedom of Information Act yes. because of the nature of central banking activities. Mm -hmm. By appointing the central bank as the, as the director, if you like, of the company, and in the case of CIB, the liquidator as well, 
We can ask no questions. Of course not. I have posed questions about the, the liquidation, about staff, whether they were connected parties and so on. They simply refuse to answer on the grounds that it is the central bank and that they are, they are therefore exempt. And I think we, perhaps the, the Freedom of Information Act and the, the central bank's exemption needs to be re-examined so that it only applies to central banking activities and not to anything that they choose to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I we take this one here, then we come here, then we finish up with the same lady here. Hi, um, good afternoon. Tim, Tim Al, um, I want to compliment you all for the work that you've been doing. Uh, I want to, you know, we talk about FYA. I want to talk about, I, hope you, I really wish you had an extra six months because, you know, um, whistleblower legislation as well as the, um, the, re the, the referendum. The referendum. Right? I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I was uh, uh, on, on a state board, and I was from Martin C on a state board. I was, I was, uh, my, my, my tenure was, uh, was, was quickly revoked when I started asking some very, very difficult questions about I'm missing $5 million and that kind of stuff. Um, the normal thing came out, right? People who know me would know I have a big mouth. And I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't cover. Um, at the end of that, I, I, the trust was actually made towards me. So, after I, uh, up, up one and you in that regard, um, um, I had legal advice at the time because I was still acting CEO of the company. Mm -hmm. um, Think your mic is off? Oh, okay, I have a big mouth. Uh, <laughs> um, right, yeah, so, oh, yeah, so I, I, I was acting CEO of the company and, um, you know, so I had legal advice at the time. I went to the police with the specific um, item in law. The, the funny, funny enough, the attack was made on Facebook, and this is where I want to get into this whole idea of, um, of, the, of the power of social media, and I, I heard us, you know, I, perhaps I might be a little hard on, on you guys for like maybe chastising some of the young people for not really getting into the process. I myself, as a, an older person, I'm 46, I, uh, 45. Um, <laughs> one of two. All the 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 all um, what this experience taught me was that we were continuously writing letters to the minister and the ministry and so forth. Nothing worked. We, you know, we complained about the, the, the actions of, of, of you know, the, what I consider the legal actions of members of the board and so forth. You know, as I said, we were revoked. Um, we were blocked and we were revoked and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, what was instructive to me is that the only time the minister and the minister himself responded was when I went to Facebook. And when I use social media to ask those same questions, I never accused anybody or any, made any allegation. I just simply asked those very, very difficult questions. And I said, we need to find out about this. We need to find out what the fact that people are making their threats towards me to the point where I have to you know, change a car every, every month and, and I have to be jumping around from Trinidad to the big one. I shouldn't even say that. Um, but the point I'm making is that the power of social media and perhaps, I mean, I know Max and I will talk about this a little more um, in terms of how do we reach people. And, and that is something that, um, and from, an, from an educator's perspective, from a communicator's perspective, you really need to, to be, you know, fashioning your, your ideas that way. As for the referendum situation, I was, as I said, I'm a, I'm a big, um, you know, social media um, practitioner. I was particularly in, enthused um, with something I saw, um, I think maybe about four or five months ago, when there was a campaign to get Anil Roberts yeah. out. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was done with a, um, a simple referendum tool, a vote tool, on Facebook. A petition. Petition on change.org. Petition, yeah, I think yeah. that's, that's, that's it. Change.org, yeah. Change.org. Yeah. And the, 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 the response was so overwhelming. I, I, I saw that, you know, that they, they were almost forced into, into interacting. And I've seen... Um, things happen on Facebook or on social media that took a life of its own and really forced the media and then other, other, the other institutions to respond. So from a referendum perspective, I mean, and I know that um, Disclosure Today would be probably an, another organization that would, would, could speak about this as well. Um, you know, would you be interested in, 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 in having discussions about how could we, and we working with, we the uh, you said about society, the younger, so younger you know, people in the audience <laughs> working, or the Facebookers, the, you know, the social media people, working with the established 
um, civil society, as, particularly lawyers, about how it is we can you know, use that particular tool to the benefit so that, in, in, a, in a sense, use that the example about Brazil you talked about where you, know, you don't have to go to parliament to have a referendum. We have, I mean, um, Facebook, we have, we have the second highest Facebook usage in the world, right? We have a saturation of 150% um, as far as cell phones concerned. So we have the mechanisms to reach the people. It's just a matter of how, how do we utilize it and how do you utilize it in an efficient and effective way. Um, the other part about it is if anybody, any lawyers here want to um, help me out with my... Um, <laughs> because, oh, and, and that intimidate... And I want to just, let me just address that. The, the idea of intimidation is real, right? Because not only, not only after I got a response from the minister, I was attacked repeatedly by, by various profiles that were not real. And, and now I'm, I'm banned from Facebook for, for a bit. So, it's, you know, I'm, I'm here just, um, you know... Waiting to um, get back on. Um, the other thing is, and my co-host is here. Uh, yeah, my co-host is here. We were, we were, we were kind of starved for funding because we were taking up positions that was anti everybody, and nobody really wanted to get on board. Uh, we, we host a morning talk. We used to host a morning talk. We've been hosting a, an evening show now. So, 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 whilst I understand that you all are the, you know, the, the, the headliners. And, and I think that people need to appreciate that the FYA is a really, really fantastic thing. But there is a level of intimidation, and, and that is for the average person. And I still don't consider myself the average person because I'm a really big mouth kind of person. I really don't care, right? You know, so that. But I know other people who, you know, will not take up a course because it simply is too dangerous. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. All right. Let me pause this quickly. Uh, good off. Good afternoon yeah. to the gentleman on the, on the, on the stage. Um, good afternoon to you all. And um, I must say that um, when you were Attorney General, I remember your 36 pieces of legislation. I can't remember if that's the number. That's the correct number? More than that. Right. But I know I, I follow 36 pieces of it. Mm. And to offer Raymond, who always has a column that is quite enlightening. Right. Um, I heard you mention, Senior Counsel, um, on the youth aspect of things, right? Now, I, just before I came here, I was actually in a little small cottage kind of meeting with some youths from 13 years to 22, I think was the oldest person, right? Um, so we formed a little group. So I just want people to think, listen to this for a moment. And from here, it should open up an opportunity for going forward. Okay. Now, some of the questions I posed to them, and they would reply. It's about 20 of them in this group, I think. Yeah, about 20 of them. We have no role or purpose after we vote, which is sad. That's one response. Because we feel even with input, we are ignored. First, and that's our personal opinion. We are the, gen the, the generation next in line to run the country. So we should, as, should, we should be as involved and participate as much as possible. And our views and opinions should be heard mostly because majority of the country are youths. That's one perspective. Youth groups are a great way to have youth represent the views and opinion of other youths. Only a, a small few actually understand what's going on and how it's affecting us. The others are talking based on what they hear or see others say. My views is that current politicians have lost their way in terms of being more concerned about filling their own pockets rather than talking of the better interests of the people of the, na or, or of the nation that they should be considering. White collar crime needs to be addressed, not swept under the rug because they might, they might be friends of the government or, or party that is ruling. Politi politicians and political parties have been focused on competition and competing with other parties mm -hmm. in, order, in order to achieve power and authority rather than fulfill their words and promises for the welfare of people. Now this is ranging from 13 to 22 mm -hmm. years. Eh? Be very careful what you're hearing. Only campaigning going on, and even what is implemented mainly has been done in the, 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 in the past few months to please the masses, which strengthens a person's point in the group. AGC giving away houses only for 100 or so close to election, just another campaign ploy. Somebody said, I mean, it's blatant. Always uh, months before election, they decide to finally fulfill their promises and give things um, and assist the poor. Right? So these are just some of the things that you are hearing. So I heard you mention that you formed a group of young people. What we need to figure out, 
And I think the solution to all these problems, because most of the people that sit here are here for a reason, and you will be preaching to the choir here. These people are the people that make the difference. These are the people that are the next generation leaders, the next accountants, the next prime minister, the next whatever it may be. These are the people that are going to do it. And the sooner we can figure out the opportunity as to what energizes these people, that's when we'll find the solution to the problems that we have in Sri and Tobago. Have a good day. All right, quickly, last one. Okay. All right, good evening, Jillian Wall, um, IBB and um, Plot, the powerful ladies of Toronto, Tobago. And uh, the plot I want to speak about, as we're talking about in terms of information sharing. Uh, part of the challenge that we have is that we seem to use consistently the mechanisms before us. Uh, we use the national stage or international stage to advance personal agendas, but we do not use our personal space, our personal influence to advance national agendas. And what I mean by that is, just for example, just in this room, we're speaking about uh, issues that uh, continue to affect and tear away at the very fabric of our society. We're speaking about incredibly obscene levels of corruption. We're speaking about not just obscene politics, but deadly politics. We're speaking about young people who are afraid to speak up, and they're afraid with great right, because the very people that have fought for the system, for example, um, the C Senior Council, Dana Sitaal, um, has, have not been uh, received help from the system. And one of the things that I think we have to start to, to really acknowledge is how we take personal responsibility to share the information that needs to be shared. Because what becomes real to people is what's in their face present all the time. And what's in their face present all the time is campaigning politics, to, um, using the national stage to advance personal agendas. And when we have the likes of Afra Raymond, the likes of um, Senior Counsel Ramesh Lawrence Miraj, instead of asking ourselves, what well, do we stand for and is there an opportunity to stand by them, we question what's their agenda, right? We don't stay focused on what we want. If we, what we see consistently rep being represented out there does not represent us, it is because we are not using mechanisms to represent the values that represent us. So those are some of the things that I, I cannot understand, and you <laughs> help me understand this, how we have such uh, very powerful, very influential people. But yet still, on a daily basis, we read about the issues consistently. We're bombarded by, um, by the issues and the propaganda through every possible mechanism, right? But when, when we complain about them hourly in our space, they're in our minds. But when there is an opportunity to represent, the streets are empty. Right? We are not using our space. When there is an, in, uh, a, an event like this, how many of the individuals that have registered here went on a campaign using social media to ensure everyone knew about something like this? And these are, no, I'm just, these are some of the things that we've got to begin to look at. How are we representing the values and the things that matter to us? How are we representing? You spoke about the Law Association. How is the Law Association <laughs> representing Dana Sitahel? Right? How are we, how do we, our advance the national agenda within our personal space and use our employers, use the associations, the chambers that are there to represent, right, and hold them accountable for doing so. Because I don't think it's constantly pointing the finger. I think we need to get better at looking in the mirror. So uh, that's a little bit of what I want to touch on. Yeah. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your um, attention this afternoon and to tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Afu Raymond and Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Marjasi for, for being here today. I hope the discussion was interesting. Uh, Wasn't uninteresting, as the, like I said, Hilton <laughs> alluded to initially. Uneventful. 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 Yeah. But it, it, it set your mind <laughs> a thinking. I'd like to leave you with one small little thing as I wrap up. When you're doing data protection, I have to try to figure out the difference between data and protection and knowledge. From data, which is what you, government collects on us. You get information. From information, you get knowledge. But it's from using the information and the knowledge that you get power. And that's the last thing I'd like to leave with you all Ooh. as you have this evening. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, hello. So before we go into our cocktails and we talk a little more together about how we can create change in Trinidad and Tobago, we just wanted to spend a few minutes. I, I too want to thank uh, Senior and Afra and Rishi, and you all can stay there. Um, 
when the disclosure today team came together and said, how are we going to celebrate the Global Day of Citizen Action? Um, we thought that we would bring these three men together to speak about freedom of information for a reason. We believe that freedom of information, accessing information, is the cornerstone. It is the lifeblood of accountability. If we as citizens, and each of you who are here, you all are specially invited. We were focused on NGOs, citizen activists, persons who of that uh, already engaged, already impassioned about your issues, and want to make your work even more impactful. We really wanted to have this kind of, 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 of participation, and I am, I am overwhelmed by the kinds of questions and the comments that have been made. But you see, in order to, for your work to have greatest impact, you first need information on what the government is doing. That's your first step. If we have to hold any politician or any public official accountable, the first step is we need to have information. It is the key. And I, I look at Ms. Olabisi Kabini, Olabisi Koboni, who taught me in Bishop Ansi High School, and who my heart, you know, I just felt a little uh, when she said tonight, we weak. You all remember when she said that? We weak. And I was like, oh my God. And, 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 and then she said, you know, all of us are not like you, Afra. You understand your right to know. You understand that this is your information and you stand on that. One of the things I hope we get before we go into our drinks and before we leave here is that everybody here understands, one, the information that the state officials, public organizations hold is not their, this mic is not working, I'm starting to scream, it is not their information. It is our information. Okay? The second point that you must understand, senior counsel said it, our act is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. I have experienced it exactly as senior has said. People do not understand how powerful our particular Freedom of Information Act is. It is more powerful than the UK legislation mm -hmm. because the UK legislation have what is called absolute exemptions. Mm -hmm. That is not known to us. We have a section 35, and I've looked at it, I've read it, I've advised on it, and it is so powerful. Section 35 says, regardless of whether the information falls in any one of these exemptions, mm -hmm. if there is a public interest in knowing this, these things are overridden. Mm -hmm. who makes the judgment? Sorry? And who makes the, judgment? the court. Wait. Great. We're, we're, going, we're taking everything step by step. So the second thing you need to know, even if, as Christoph is saying, you write to the uh, public authority and they say, mm, this is confidential information, as happened with Afro. This is a, 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 a piece of advice given by a lawyer, and that is privileged communication, and under the law, that is confidential. If they tell you that as a citizen, you'd be like, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do next because they tell me I can't get it. I'm looking in the act. It's saying that is exempt. I want you to first know that if you're dealing with public money, if that's what your request is in relation to public money, if it's in request uh, 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 information that could possibly expose corruption, mm -hmm. in a, inappropriate and improper conduct by public officials, there may very well be a public interest override under Section 35 mm -hmm. that you can take to court and get it exactly in the same way as Afro Raymond through JCC has done. But of course, you all will be saying, but Margaret, how can we do that? Afro Raymond, you know, obviously got, was able to convince and have uh, people associating with him, have uh, lawyers um, taking issues to court, because even though Afro, you don't like lawyers, you could not have gotten that judgment without a lawyer. I love them. Okay? <laughs> Right? And that is one of the things that we have like recognized. I love them at all. Yeah, yeah. What a powerful partnership these two could make yeah. on civic issues. And so one of the things I want to say this evening, when I just, I'm going to take two minutes, it's not going to be long before 
and you actually have wine in your cocktails tonight, so we'll have a little good time. But um, I, I, I want, I think this is a, a, a backdrop for you as well to understand what we are going to be trying to do in Disclosure today. You've heard each of the, we've heard many people speak about what the challenges are. We've heard uh, senior counsel say, where are the pro bono lawyers? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm saying to you, the pro bono lawyers are now here. We in the house. Okay? Where are the pro bono lawyers? Another, another point that has been made is intimidation. We are going to be intimidated, um, reprisal and all of that. And it's a very important concern. And it is a very real concern. We will be showing you on Disclosure Today, Transparency on Demand, how we have created a model where we are providing strategic confidentiality to citizens as they make their freedom of information requests. So we are trying. I am not saying we have all of the solutions, but you know what you have? You have one pro bono lawyer willing to take it up if you have been refused and if we form the view that there is a public interest in that information. Two, we are providing strategic confidentiality if you want to make requests for information, we will do it on your behalf. So disclosure today, the NGO, the citizen of Trinidad and Tobago will go to court to get the information, will make the, the freedom of information legislation. Another issue um, that was raised here by Timmy is the power of social media. We are also going to be giving you the power to create what are called information campaigns and proposal campaigns for proposals for your issues. And Afra, I must remember this very important point he made. He said, FOI, could actually be a, a legal, what was it? A window for, mm -hmm. what, what did you say? Your exact words, because I loved it. A legal window to speak the truth. Beautiful. Because that is one of the revelations, the, the, the things we were looking at when we were developing and designing the solution that is the platform disclosure today. We recognize, especially, I am in another life, I'm the executive director of the Caribbean Procurement Institute. We train public sector prof professionals in public procurement, anti-corruption, governance issues. And we engage with public sector professionals. And exactly that point that Afro made is a point that we constantly saw. There are very good people in the public mm -hmm. service. There are people, there are far more people in the public service who want to do right mm -hmm. than those who want to do wrong. Mm -hmm. And they just want a legal window. Mm -hmm. They just want a way to peep through and give the information. And so Disclosure Today gives public sector officials the opportunity strategically by asking a question, so you're not whistleblowing, by asking a question, not even in your own name, through Disclosure Today, a question that you may know the answer to, and allow Disclosure Today to create an information campaign about it, we are, we are trying to create a space. We are trying to create a space for you citizens who have the courage and who have the vision. Because each of you have the vision in your respective fields, in, the, in where you're operating, in, you know, if it's environment, if it's in youth, if it's in constitutional reform. You have the vision. You also have the courage to take action. We want to support you and give you that infrastructure. And I think the best way to explain Disclosure today is by telling the story of two citizens. Meet Tom and Jerry. They no, no, but, but it's not showing. I need to start it over, please. <clears throat> and the volume. All that to say, while we're waiting for that to finish, um, I would we'd like you all, of course, to, we can continue the discourse. You can come and talk to um, the Disclosure Today team. Who is here? We have Justin Phelps. Meet Tom and Jerry. Where's Justin? Okay, we have Tanya Alexis, young lawyer. I'm very proud of Tanya. All right, Tanya Alexis is actually the 2014... <laughs> top graduate of Hewitting Law School Ooh. and valedictorian of her year. And Tanya is one of the pro bono lawyers in Disclosure today. Tanya Alexis represents the future because she has been headhunted by the top firms. And I'm on tape, so it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and she chose to become a part of a vision to serve country Very instead good. of self. That's the future. 
as to future. Um, we have Roshad Smith here, who is our webmaster and technology lead. I'm not seeing Justin, but yeah, let's just tell the story of Disclosure today in two minutes. Tom and Jerry, Meet they have Tom. a lot in common. They're socially conscious and passionate about making their country a better place. They're angry about corruption, waste, mismanagement, and excessive government secrecy. They both decided to do something about it. Over a seven-year period, they researched, started blogs, and created online communities to raise public awareness for their issues. They use access to information laws to try to get information on public decisions. But this is where the similarity ends. Tom prepares his requests himself, often with a pen. He doesn't keep and file digital copies of the request for easy sharing. He writes them in his own name and sends over 50 of them to various public agencies. He's often ignored or refused. Jerry carefully thinks about his requests and obtains legal advice to craft them correctly. He makes them in the name of an NGO and talks with other associations and stakeholders to support him. He makes the public aware that the request was made, placing pressure on the government to respond. Although he's refused, he meets a young lawyer that agrees with Jerry's cause and takes the case on a no-win, no-fee basis. <coughs> with his lawyer's help, Jerry wins his first FOI in court and receives public acclaim for his anti-corruption work. But the story doesn't end here. Tom finds out about a new, award-winning social governance platform which connects citizen activists with special pro bono lawyers that allows you to also create powerful social media and reform campaigns for your causes. Disclosure today, transparency on demand. Tom signs up and creates his profile, highlighting his social change issues, makes his digital requests for information, and easily and automatically creates an information campaign, which is shared on social media. If the government doesn't give the information in the time allowed through DT, he can access legal support to take the matter to court. If the government doesn't respond, it's automatically noted, and citizens are able to raid and rank the relevant public authority. Through DT, he connects with other citizen activists and associations who join his campaign. This places more pressure on the government to respond. Tom also gets help to design a reform proposal to his member of parliament, which he's now built a powerful social lobby behind. DT helps Tom to accomplish in one year what it took Jerry seven years to do. Jerry has joined Tom on Disclosure Today, and now they have one more thing in common. Disclosure Today, transparency on demand. The future of public governance is social governance. A game changer for civic innovation. Yay. So that, so that, so that, so that is the platform. That is disclosure today. That is what we are launching. Um, we initially were going to launch this in December 2014. Um, we have already received international acclaim and award. We, you'll see that there for the prototype that we've developed. In December 2014, we started looking again at the security issues, and so we uh, slowed it down. So we previewed it in December for, um, 2014 to an audience of about 150 people in the Hyatt Regency. Over the last few months, we've actually changed something quite significant in terms of what we're doing on the platform, which is why we have not opened it up for you all as yet. And it is this. Initially, the vision was that we wanted as many people as possible to come onto this platform. We saw it as, you know, social media, social media meets um, governance, public governance, so social governance. So we wanted everyone to come on the platform and make all of these um, requests. On further reflection, um, we felt that was focusing too much on quantity and numbers as opposed to quality of interactions on this site. Because we, one of the things you look at when you look at the literature in terms of civic technology right now, it is showing that there are these kinds of sites developing all over the world, not, ex not as good as ours, right? No, no, just little pieces, but we've kind of pulled together several ideas that have never been pulled together before. So Trinidad and Tobago really has an opportunity, once we launch this and get this right, to really be on, you know, yeah. yeah, and we already are because we're the global social entrepreneurship winners for the idea. But, but the thing is, um, we had to ask ourselves and the team, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to say, oh, we had 5,000 people on the side, we had 10,000 people on the side? Or are we trying to say, wow, we had five lit pieces of litigation that were developed off of the side that actually drove real change, right? 
Um, and when you look at the literature on the civic technology sites, you're seeing that they, they are hitting upon a problem that they're recognizing technology is not enough. We must combine technology with what is already existing, the culture, the traditions of society, the people must be involved. And when we started to really consider this deeply, we said we don't want to just have anybody come on, on, the, on the platform, you know, just with your name and your email address and bam, you're there and you, you can, uh, there's also a whistleblowing aspect to the site. We're not gonna discuss that today, but it's request, propose, disclose, there's information in there. And we said, you know what? We will have the same problem that Facebook has with trolls and people coming with, you know, f you know ridiculous requests for information. It's going to be coming out of our platform. And we said, no, we want to encourage what? Responsible citizen engagement. So that has slowed down the process, which we are now ready to launch. But what we are doing is that in order to use any of the functions on the platform, you will have to be a verified user. Be calm. I know you're listening, but my confidentiality, what are you talking about? One, anybody can join with your name and email address and or with a social media account. You can browse requests on anything that is available on the site for public viewing to members. But in order to use any of the functions, you must become a verified user by scanning in IDs. It is a lengthy process, yes, and you must be approved by us to become a member. What we are seeing there is this, you are verifying to us, the Disclosure Today team, who will be standing in the gap for you, who will be seeking to protect you. You are telling us that you are real. We are not going to be doing that for trolls. We are not gonna be doing that for busy, you know, people who want to use the site for bacchanal, who want to use the site for their political aims and objectives. We are going to pr be protecting responsible citizens. And what we are trying to say is verify yourself to us. We will, if you choose, provide confidentiality to you in terms of what you ask um, of public authorities, what you just, whatever you want to do in respect of, uh, of the site. But we hope that the site is going to be a real platform for NGOs and inspiring people to become citizen activists where you will have your profile page, you'll be able to highlight your social change issues, you'll be able to get people to catalyze bring people uh, around your issues and join with you and all of that. And, and, and that's what we're trying to do in Disclosure today, Transparency on Demand. We just wanted to give you that quick introduction to us. Um, we wanted to open it today and say, come on, log on and sign on yet again. We, we said we were going to do it in December. We said we we're going to do it today. We need a few more days. Okay, we need a few more days because we got, we got, we got it handed to us and we're looking at, but what about this? Why is this not being represented? We are working with um, really top, what do you call them? Developers, MIT Portugal spin-off. They're in Portugal right now. One member of our team, Elena Hewitt, is in Portugal with them right now, um, working with them. It's not as easy as it sounds. Many of you who, who may be in technology know it's very difficult. And I think because I and some of us on the team are like, oh my God, we need to have this now. You know, we have been really like, Yes, it's coming now, and we're going to have it now, but we're going to have it in, in the next few days because we actually, we now have had it, and we are working on it and testing it. Um, and so all of you, we have your email addresses. We'll be sending you emails about it. Now let's go have some wine and um, some food. I want to thank all of you all for being here and making the um, discussions and contributions so, um, you know, and, you know, rich. Be I would like, while you're having your wine and your, your food, there's a booth in the back, yeah, being run by Anonymat Multimedia, headed up by my son, who's the, long, the guy with the long raster. Here there. <laughs> there's a booth in the back. If you can go, they will discuss with you, you know, just a little interview we might want to have with some of you um, about your experience here this evening, and they'll take pictures, and then you might be on the global site. Uh, you know, so you can, yeah. So feel free to meander along across there. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you again, Rishi, Afra, and Ramit. And I hope you all stay so that we could continue to talk to you in the break. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. So we have to keep playing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. 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 It's Thank you. 